Take me on home to this side. I'm vibing. Never alone in the asylum. That's what's what's up. Anarchy rule. It was wild, but through it all, you never smiled. Jokes on you. I'm in your head, so look who's laughing now. Remember in Arkham City. I killed your girl. So pretty. That was the night you let me die. But when I looked you in the eye, that's when I knew we'd be together. Look who's laughing now. I'm stuck in your head and I'm laughing. Ah, I feel you with dread and I can't stop laughing. Your parents are dead and I can't stop laughing. What else can I do? Now I'm part of you. I am the clown, the prince of clown. And we've had a hell of a time. You're part of me, I'm part of you. And now there's nothing left to do. I just can't wait till I'm in control. Who'll be laughing then? I drove you round the bend, then I'm laughing. I'm with you till the end, and I can't stop laughing. I killed all your friends, and I can't stop laughing. Ah! <laughs> Ooh, yeah. I think I can taste your fear. Now that my time is near, I'm in your blood, I'm so alive. I only wish you'd let me drive. It won't be long till I make you kill. Who'll be laughing then? Barbara's dead and I'm laughing. Ah! Jason Todd's dead and I can't stop laughing. I'm even dead and I can't stop laughing. What else can I do? Now I'm part of you. I drove you down the bend and I'm laughing. I'm with you till the end and I can't stop laughing. I killed all your friends and I can't stop laughing. I'm cock-a-doodle-doo. I'm vibing. All because of you. 16 times I'm stuck in your head and I'm laughing. Ah, I fill you with dread and I can't stop laughing. Your parents are dead and I can't stop laughing. <laughs> I feel you with dread, and I can't stop laughing. Your parents are dead, and I can't stop laughing. What else can I do? Now I'm part of you. Good morning, everyone. How we doing? How we doing? Hopefully, you're doing good. I know I'm doing good. The hair is a little crazy today. It's a little crazy today. It's okay. We'll manage. How's everybody doing? Everybody doing good? Everybody feeling alive? Feeling magical, dare I say. Yeah, shout out to the chess club. Shout out to the chess club. Damn right. Damn right. Chris, Flacco, Flaco, maybe? I don't know. Uh, Pillow, Katie. Um, feel much better for my cold. I feel like I'm starting to get a little bit of a cold. You might be able to hear it. Just like a little bit. A little bit. We visited my family for Easter up in Laramie, uh, Wyoming. Which is, I mean, it was weird because it's probably the last time we're going to visit them. Because they're moving. It's not like... That sounds really ominous and bad, but it's it's the last time we'll visit them ever. No, it's the last time we'll visit them there because they plan to move back to Colorado, which will be awesome. Um, but every time I go up to Wyoming, I get super, like I get crud in my lungs. I just, like, I feel terrible afterwards, which is weird. Like I shouldn't, you would think the air would be cleaner up there. Apparently not. I don't know. I don't know. Is that the apricot Red Bull? Yes, this is strawberry apricot. Very good. Shout out to Red Bull. They sent me a pallet of it, and uh, I'm here for it. 
Shout out to Red Bull, Pog, Poggers. They're pogging. They did pog. The pog has been achieved. Um. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, we have a couple of things and tidbits to jump through today. We'll kind of gauge how much time we actually we actually have. We're in sort of a weird lull in the gaming industry right now because basically we've gotten some big releases in March. April is pretty damn empty. I'm not sure. I mean, Stellar Blade, I think. Um, What else is coming in April? I don't know. Stellar Blade, yeah. Manor Lords. Oh, is Manor Lords officially coming? I've been keeping an eye on it, but I just, at this point, I, I kind of have phased out or tuned out the release dates. Yeah, April 26th. Yeah, so Manor Lords is coming out. Um, yeah, there's there's not a ton. No rest for the wicked. Oh, no way. I thought that was May. Okay. I thought that was like early May. No, it's April 16th, so it's sooner than I thought. Wow. Okay, yeah, so No Rest for the Wicked. That's that crazy one from the Ori team um, that's like Soulsborne inspired, but it has this really cool art style and is isometric. Seems really cool. So that's coming. But the point is like April is a little bit, it's usually pretty empty. And part of that is because everybody's kind of, at this point, if you have a big announcement to make or trailers or something, and you're looking at April or May, you're probably just going to wait until June for like summer game fest and all the, the Xbox events, like the E3 knockoff events. So we just kind of land in a spot where people have stuff to show, but they're not going to show it now, you know, cause there's, there's just not much uh, reason to do it. Um, do, 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 do. Let me, Ba, 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 ba. Uh, there it is. Yeah, the other thing that I, I would fully expect us to see. Um, <laughs> oh, Joraptor. Oh, that's funny. That's funny. Okay. Today's April 1st, everybody. Okay, so April 1st, if somehow you don't know, April Fools, you're gonna see a lot of stories posted today or videos posted today that are just totally like made up and joking. Um, it's not like, don't take it seriously, but uh, this one was funny. Joel Raptor posted this six hours ago. What a nice surprise. God of War, Children of Jotunheim, a standalone game focused on a trace is coming in 2024. Teaser trailer right here. I thought of you as a friend. Whatever you're planning on doing is reckless. If you think I will be part of this, forget it. Go. I thought I could do this alone. Not bad. But Not a bad trailer cut. <laughs> Come on, boy. You must prepare yourself. It's not bad. Not bad. The text kind of gives it away. The the. No custom shots kind of gives it away, but I mean, it's a, it's not real. So <laughs> you'd, you'd expect there to be something to give it away. Damn it. My dumb ass forgot what day it was. Oh yeah. That's funny. That's pretty funny. Oh man. So yeah, just be buckled up for, for those posts. So it's going to be funny. Anyway, what I was saying was that I fully expect that there will probably be some news about Assassin's Creed Red this month. Um, and this is backed up. I mean, Joel Raptor has talked about this on our podcast. Uh, Assassin's Creed Valaha. Assassin's Creed Valaha. 
was properly revealed on April 28th of 2020 with cinematic trailer and first screenshots two days later. Remember they did that? They hired the guy that does like the drawings and he did the custom artwork. And so he drew the whole set piece and everything in real time, which was kind of cool. Um, and then a couple days later, they did that first big reveal trailer, cinematic trailer that was really uh, overwhelmingly positively received. People loved it. <clears throat> so if they're doing the same thing this year, they're going to probably late April, do some sort of unique announcement um, to get people kind of interested. And then they'll do a trailer a couple of days later, late April, early May, and then they'll do a full reveal in June. Or I think their event is July, right? I think they boosted it back to July. So whenever it is, yeah, it was boss logic. That's who it is. Yeah. So we'll see. We'll see, but I expect to hear something like that, but it's just a, a weird time where we don't typically get, um, we don't typically get a lot of content or reveals and stuff. So it's going to be weird. I mean, thankfully we have season one of Suicide Squad to keep us entertained, right? So that's awesome. Uh, Mr. Raves, do you have the cameras in 4K 60 mode and then downscale to 1080p and OBS, Luke, or is everything in 1080p? Yeah, this is a 4K 60 camera going into a special Blackmagic. Um, it, it does Blackmagic, but it's also the brand name. Uh, but it's a Blackmagic capture card in the streaming PC. And then for streams, it downscales, but it also means that when I have a separate instance of OBS just for filming main channel videos, I can record 4K 60 videos um, without having to like do an SD card, remove the SD card or anything. So it's nice. Um, overkill for most people. Most people uh, probably don't notice, but I notice, so I consider it worth it. Um, okay. <clears throat> Speaking of Ubisoft, y'all remember Ubisoft shut down the crew yesterday and made it unplayable for customers and international legal action is being taken against them starting tomorrow, hopefully. Yeah, I mean, there's, it's kind of a big legal, I mean, of course, international law is way more complicated, but there's a bunch of question marks around whether companies are allowed to like do that. <laughs> to me, the answer is simple. Make private servers, allow people to do peer to peer stuff, something like that. Easy, easy peasy. Like, I don't think anybody's demanding that you keep server infrastructure up and running for decades and decades and decades of games. Of course, if you could do that, that'd be great. But I don't think anybody's reasonably expecting that, especially for games that start to have player numbers drop. At the, like, at the least, we would expect that we could continue playing games that we've bought. So make private servers. Like, that's the easiest fix. And the fact that they don't go to that little extra step to do that, I can't think of it as anything other than just laziness. Like, I know that it's expensive. I know that they aren't making money on it. So they're like, well, why would we put more mo people and more money into this? Um, when we're not going to see a return, but it's like, it's the right thing to do. Like, when did we stop caring about the right thing to do? <laughs> do we just not give a crap? <laughs> okay. <clears throat> you should watch the end of Angry Joe's show stream on Suicide Squad season one. I mean, I saw he posted an angry rant. Um, is that what you're talking about? That video or the end of the stream? He did like a whole stream. Yeah, these are all like Q&A sessions. So maybe the video is what you mean? Hey guys. Let's see. I refuse to close all of my tabs when I'm gaming and when I'm playing and I've switched to Opera GX and it is- I use Opera GX as well. Um, but you said skip to the end time as it oh the twitch stream dc fan we could have been playing hell divers we could have been reviewing other anger joe's so funny i refuse to believe this game took eight years to develop i think everybody's just genuinely baffled by it yeah it was announced four years ago pretty sure uh announcement trailer Three years ago, August 22nd, 2020. 
almost four years ago. Golly. Getting cut to pieces. And now it's just crazy to see how little, <laughs> like how little is actually there. Um, I mean, what? Okay, maybe we do this. Gotham Knights announcement. I don't know what this segment's called, Jacob. We'll figure it out. I don't know. We're just going to kind of meander through this discussion because I find it interesting. So years ago, in times long gone past, ages, centuries, millennia ago, um, there was a legendary time in which the world was unraveled in a terrible, suffocating, miserable pandemic. And we needed a light of hope. We needed a spark. We needed something. And there was an event called the DC Fandom, where DC was going to come out and showcase not just movies, but trailers for shows and uh, games and spinoffs and all sorts of things that they were working on. This was their chance to save us all. However, it didn't end up being quite what we were hoping it would be. You see, first, they revealed a game that people were not super in love with. People weren't super confident this would turn out super well. Uh, after the extended and extremely long intro sequence, it looked to be an interesting new Batman game, but it's a different Batman, so it seems to be in a different universe or a different timeline or something, but it's a Batman game. And very, we very quickly realized that this was the rumored game from um, Warner Brothers Montreal, I believe is where they are. And uh, this was a co-op game. They were the team that worked on Batman Arkham Origins. They've always done kind of support stuff or secondary stuff in the same vein as like Rocksteady, but usually their own little spin. They, they just do their own thing. And a lot of people saw this and were like, okay, interesting. But the game had shifted. The game wasn't what people initially thought it was going to be. We all thought it was going to be co-op. We all thought it was going to be multiplayer. We all thought it was going to be live service, like crazy monetized, blah, blah, blah. Didn't end up actually being that. What we ended up getting was a, a, an interesting kind of amalgamation of a bunch of different ideas. It, it was a very, very different thing. And while people weren't like super stoked on it, they thought at least it looked a little interesting and maybe we'll, uh, may maybe it'll be fun. Who knows? At, at the very least, it seemed to be different um, than what we were kind of dreading it would be. Um, yeah, some, some different stuff. Knights. Ooh, baby. So different playable characters, all sorts of stuff. So people were like, okay, I mean, it's probably not going to be great, but at least it's something, right? They've been working on something and now we see it. The trailer they dropped immediately after this. Everybody immediately. I mean, this is what we saw. A slow logo reveal. People were like, what? Oh my God. It's Brainiac. From the creators of the Batman Arkham series. People start screaming. No way. No way. Rocksteady's back, man. At this time, it had been five years. Well, I guess four years because they did the VR game. But five years since their last big release. So people were like, they've been cooking. They've been off doing their own thing. There had been rumors at this time, um, which later we found out were not accurate. But there were rumors at this time that Rocksteady had been working on a Superman game. That Rocksteady had been working on various different things. We didn't realize that they were working on, like they were working on a, a, a big co-op shooter, looter shooter thing. But we were like, it's rock steady. It's been five years. They've been cooking. They, they're going to have something awesome to show. And when they revealed it, people initially were pretty positive. I mean, they thought that graphically it looked really, really good.
worry, boss. We got this. Hey! Boomer! Lay down suppressing fire! Keep it down, Hal. These are still ringing after that last Barney. <laughs> what is that? <clears throat> Australian for hangover? I believe I can translate. Boomerang has a concussion. From the enemy you missed in our last encounter. <laughs> Guess those teeth are sharper than your eyes, Shark Man. I never, you never miss. miss. Never miss. Yeah. Looks good, right? Looks good. Yeah, none of this was in the game. It's okay. Um, <laughs> it's not okay, but still. But all this happens. There's some fun fighting sequences that we see played out, and then something happens. Right? This this was the moment that got us all kind of crazy excited. Few years off the old sentence. That's reminding me of something. Oh yeah, Waller's stupid alpha target. Who we supposed to be killing again? Alpha target, okay. The most important target. Oh my god. Oh, look, it's Superman. The mighty Superman has just rescued that pilot. What a show off. Beat it, Spandex! We're on a top secret assassination mission here. No, no. <laughs> So, people were like, ooh, interesting. This could be cool. That would not age well, my friends. What, over the course of the next like, couple of years, people were consistently surprised at a lack of reveals, a lack of clarity. And the more people found out about the game, the less enthused they were. So this was originally announced for 2022 which at the time was about a year and a half away. Plenty of time to polish it up, plenty of time to figure that out. Gotham Knights was scheduled for 2021. Uh, this was also at the time when like everybody was getting their, their estimates wrong because COVID delayed things so much. So everybody was announcing way too early and revealing way too early. So it was a whole thing, but Gotham Knights would eventually release in 2022, October of 2022. And then Suicide Squad, of course, released earlier uh, this year. Gotham Knights at the time that it launched got some more mixed reviews. The biggest problem for Gotham Knights when it came out was simply that it, it was, it was really buggy. It was kind of broken for some people, not even kind of, it just was. It ran really poorly. There were shader compilation issues, but it was a game. Like it wasn't a great game. I played through the whole thing. Um, it was like, it's probably you know, like your quintessential seven, 7.5 out of 10 when it's working properly. It's fine. It's even pretty good if you really like superhero games. It's nothing that's gonna blow you away. There's a ton of remnants of its former life, I think, as a live service game. There's a flood of crafting components. There's a flood of um, like these different levels and things. And there's so many cosmetics in this game. It'll blow your mind. Like there are just dozens and dozens and dozens of outfits for each and every character. It's wild. And I think the reason for that was not necessarily out of the goodness of their heart, but I think what happened was that at some point they decided to pivot from making this like a live service game where you're just straight up like paying for loot boxes and paying for skins and all that. And they reworked it so that you could get all those items in game. And it just ended up flooding the player. Like it was an actual instance where I think there were too many cosmetics, too many pieces of armor that you'd have in your inventory at any time it was just overwhelming but the core combat was fine having different playable characters was kind of cool it was it was fine you know it, it nothing crazy this ui always reminded me of like a mobile game like it just seems very tappable right very tappable ui 
Uh, yeah, you see the different skill trees. If I go back a few frames. So here you can see like the inventory. Doesn't it look like a mobile game? I mean, come on, come on. So you see the different levels. Each suit has different power and main status effects. And it seemed to me that they probably at some point had at least crafting components available for acquisition through some sort of monetized means. And at some point it pivoted off. I don't have evidence of that. It's just the game seems really weirdly designed if that wasn't the case. Um, and good on them for pivoting off of it and not charging for like gameplay affecting um, suits and, and cosmetics and things. Uh, good on them. But it's still just like a little weird. There's remnants of it still here. But the game ended up being fine. But everybody was like, okay, well, now if this was fine, imagine what Rocksteady's cooking. If it, this is fine, what Rocksteady's doing because they're such a better studio is going to be amazing, right? And then we got Suicide Squad. And, you know, as the years went by, we started seeing more and more trailers for it. More and more reveals of cinematics, of gameplay, of mechanics and things. And what was really surprising is that Pretty much the entire game's cinematics are revealed in these trailers ahead of time. They kept saying, oh, this is the most cinematic experience uh, we've ever put together. It has the most cutscenes by minute count of any game we've ever made, which I'm sure on a, by counting minutes of cutscenes, it's probably true because those previous games didn't used to do full cutscenes. They would do these like gameplay cutscene things. Um, and even then there weren't that many and the games were fairly short, but they were very polished and very lean. But what was fascinating about Suicide Squad's uh, marketing cycle was that it sort of went like, let me find this. Yeah, so what was interesting about it is that as time went by, their focus sort of shifted um, because initially they were just going like, if you imagine the top half of this is like, let's just say, I have an actual tablet. I can just use that. Um, the top half of this, let's just say, is like live service. And then the bottom half of this, let's say, is story stuff. Okay. So they were like, initially when they announced it, they were like, you should be excited for this because it's going to be. Initially, it was very ambiguous, but then they're like, it's a live service game. You should be so excited. And they were leaning really heavily into the live service thing, right? They were showing off the loot uh, or the gear score, all the live service mechanics around um, the looter shooter stuff, finding different materials and crafting better stuff and re-rolling for better stats on your weapons and stuff. And the response was generally pretty negative, right? People really were not stoked on it. So... They pivoted and I made a video about this at the time where I said, if your game is actually pretty narrative heavy, sell it to players based on that. And then you might be able to trick some of them into playing the live service stuff, but narrative gamers will not connect with live service mechanics willingly. <laughs> so like, if you want this game to sell, if you want it to be successful, you've got to find a way to reframe this from it's a great live service game into it's a narrative game that has live service elements. And sure enough, that's what they started to do. They started to pivot. So they shifted off of that. Remember, they delayed the game by about a year. It was like February or March of 2023 that they revealed that first gameplay thing that was just super, super poorly received. Just shooting the big purple glowing zits. Everybody lost their minds, hated it. And so they delayed it almost a year. And when we started to see it again, all of a sudden the marketing campaign was all focused on narrative stuff. They had pivoted off of the live service pitch primarily. And as we got closer to launch, they started trying to reframe it because they're like, hey, this is a live service game, so let's settle down. But what ended up happening is that you had a bunch of players who had seen it revealed here and were not stoked on that idea. And then you had people who were exposed to it over here and as we got closer to launch and they started bringing up more of the live service stuff, they were less and less about it because they're like, this, this is not what I would like, what I like, this isn't what I wanted. And sure enough, like as people were looking for this in the game, because again, they kept saying it has the most cutscenes by minute count of any game we've ever made. It's still from Rocksteady, the narrative team that brought you Arkham City and Arkham Knight. They kept reframing it that way. And sure enough, when we got it, 
there were maybe an hour, hour and a half worth of actual narrative stuff. And beyond that, it, it was all just grinding the same missions over and over again. And then even for the season one update, there was a two minute, 53 second, I think it was cutscene when you got the Joker and that's it. That's it. Less than three minutes of narrative content. It's crazy. But they had pitched it as, well, but it's just as narrative or it's from the same narrative team that brought you Arkham Knight. So you should be really stoked about it. And it's going to be awesome. But it just goes to show you how dangerous it is to set up false expectations, which is what happened. Um, you know, I had said initially, yeah, you should focus on the narrative. If your game is actually narrative heavy, sell it based on that. Don't try to sell it on the live service stuff nobody's excited for. Try to sell it on the stuff people do like and the things that people connect with your studio over. But instead, they had built almost exclusively a live service game. The narrative was certainly an afterthought. Um, and so we just ended up with a confused game that pitched itself on both sides of a very polarizing fence. If the, the black line is a fence, it's literally both sides of it. And so they just ended up not making anybody particularly happy. And amazingly enough, the, the legacy of Gotham Knights versus Suicide Squad is that Gotham Knights actually ended up being a better game. There was just more stuff there. It was far less repetitive. Um, and while it wasn't great, and while I found the like plot twist ending to be asinine, I, I thought at the very least it was a game that was fine. And that's unfortunately more than can be said for Suicide Squad. <laughs> <laughs> like it was a package that made sense. I think at that price point or, or a slightly lower price point, but suicide squad is just a baffling mess of a game. And at no point, like you see that initial trailer from, from four years ago. And you're like, how on earth did they go and spend four more years after that working on it? And they could only manage like two and a half hours of content that they repeated for 10 hours. And then a seasonal update that has a three minute cutscene, And then they give you a playable character with no new missions or anything. It's just stunning. Like no part of it makes sense. It's baffling. And um, unfortunately, I think that's going to be the legacy is that it, like Gotham Knights is a decent game. Suicide Squad is a game that doesn't make any damn sense at all. It's just crazy. Why did Strabbit? Thank you for the two. Came for the review. Stayed for the MS Paint. You're damn right you did. That's the uh, that's the real money maker right there. MS Paint. Um, Kappa Claus. Thank you for the two. At this point, you should be sponsored by MS Paint. Yeah, call me and Microsoft. Call me, please. Uh, Mr. Steel, you your kill. I almost said girl. Mr. Steel, you kill. Thank you for the two. Suicide Squad makes Gotham Knights look better. Yeah, I mean everything is a matter of contrast, and you just don't know what you got till it's gone. And it's just really funny that. We all just assumed that Gotham Knights was going to be the inferior product because Rocksteady's Rocksteady. But it goes to show you guys, you cannot assume anything. You can't assume anything in the gaming industry. If you assume that, well, Cyberpunk 2077 is going to launch amazingly well. They made The Witcher 3. How would Cyberpunk be bad? <laughs> and then we get it and it's like, oh my God. Okay. Um, and, you know, the same thing goes for Rocksteady. It's a, a world-renowned studio. They made some of the most successful games of the 20 teens. There's no way that they blow this. Or I guess it's even pre-20 teens because uh, Arkham City was 2011 or 2010. So, like, that five-year period, five, six-year period, they made some amazing games. We just assumed that they would also make a great thing here, but nope, nope. Same thing happened to Bioware. Yeah, a lot of people were like, oh, Mass Effect and Andromeda is going to be amazing because they made, I, I believe, uh, Dragon Age Inquisition one game of the year in 2014. They had released some amazing games uh, prior to that, you know, with the Mass Effect trilogy. Granted, Mass Effect 3, people had mixed responses to, to say the least. But still, they had made some amazing games. And then they've just had two consecutive flops back to back. You just can't assume anything. And it's why, like... Uh, shocker it's why i think being skeptical it matters because usually when a game is going to be bad there are warning signs usually there are things that are sticking out like a sore thumb that you can point to like when we saw 
Cyberpunk 2077 at E3 in 2019, like a year and a half before it launched. I remember, like, granted, it was very work in progress, but I think my, my video at the time when I got back from E3, I said that they played it very safe because none of the stuff that they showed was particularly amazing and it didn't, like, it wasn't as exciting as the trailers had made it out to be. It seemed like a, a combination of a bunch of different concepts of games, but it really did not have that magical quality we saw in the trailers. It just looked like a video game. It, it didn't seem that remarkable. There were also like technical issues and stuff, but of course it was work in progress, so whatever. Um, and if they had been more transparent, we would have seen a lot more red flags. But even like uh, with Cyberpunk, when we started to see that they were holding back reviews, that they weren't letting people review the last gen versions that they were still selling, those were all red flags that stood out and people rightly started calling out um, people who brought it out uh, or, or refused to, to bring it up. Um, so I, I think you just shouldn't assume anything when it comes to the gaming industry, because things can change over and swap very, very quickly. You should evaluate like the social cachet of developers and publishers, because naturally, if you make consistently amazing games, the odds are much higher that you'll make a great game the next time. It's not a foregone conclusion. You shouldn't bet your life, life savings on it, but like from software, the odds are pretty good that the Elden Ring DLC is going to be pretty good. The odds are pretty high that whatever game comes after that is going to be pretty good. They, they just have demonstrated that they know what it takes and that they do a good job. Is it possible that they release a broken buggy mess that's just terrible and uninteresting? And then somehow Joel ends up in it and Joel gets killed again. Sure, that's technically possible. You shouldn't like cynically assume that that will happen, but it's technically possible and you should always acknowledge that. Because again, there's been developers that you would have been like, there's no way that they blow their next game. After Arkham Knight, there was no way anybody thought that the, the next Rocksteady game would be a colossal flop. Nobody would have thought that after The Witcher 3, CDPR would blow the witch or cyberpunk 2077, but it does happen. Um, even with BGS, the idea that coming off of Skyrim, their next game would be sort of like a mixed bag of good and bad with fallout four. And then they would totally blow it with fallout 76. And then Starfield would end up being a disappointment for most people. You never would have assumed that, but I think it's just because most developers, most have peaks and then they have valleys and then they peak again and then valleys you know they have ups and downs because it's a team of people and people have pros and cons people have ups and downs and so you should never think that any studio or publisher is infallible um because they'll always screw stuff up even big studios like rockstar they'll put out an amazing game like red dead 2 and then they try to do an online mode for it and it's just a total disaster and they abandon it so it's going to be I think moving forward in the industry, we just always have to remember anything can implode. <laughs> just be cautious, be, uh, try to be as fair as possible. And when it comes to, to games like Gotham Knights, maybe the legacy of Gotham Knights is that maybe we, we should appreciate even the sevens and the eights out of tens because they very quickly can turn into threes and fours if you're not careful <laughs> very quickly um yeah but that's i've been on a downward trend before starfield i mean yeah i've been saying that for years um i think starfield was the point where a lot of people realized what a lot of us had been saying for a long time which were pointing out all of the red flags and being like hey guys like they're relying on consistently and an overwhelmingly outdated technology this is this is getting kind of bad Um, okay. I'm definitely a proud skeptic now. Well, I think it's actually unironically why we've seen such increased growth on these channels. Shout out to you guys, by the way. Um, and I think it's because in real time, people have experienced what happens when you're hyped for stuff and it comes crashing down. 
and they've learned the hard way, unfortunately, the value of being skeptical about things. And of course, there's always going to be the, the people that just fundamentally don't understand what, what skepticism is that will still be like, I thought you were skeptical. What do you mean you like this game? It's like, okay, tell me you're an idiot without telling me you're an idiot. Uh, like, I'm sorry, it's so hard to grasp, but skepticism, all it is is that you don't believe something until there's sufficient evidence to believe it. And when it comes to, I mean, you can apply it at every facet of your life, but it's a great way to avoid being conned. It's a great way to avoid being conned. Um, and it, it matters if you actually value what's true and what's not. And like, if you don't want to just hype yourself up because it's fun, but rather you only want to get excited for stuff that deserves your attention. And in the gaming industry, especially like we're talking about an industry where there have been very consistent um, I'd say releases. Yeah. Every year we get two or three that looked pretty good that ended up having tons of problems at launch that ended up being broken, that ended up having major problems. And usually there were red flags with it, but people didn't want to look at them or acknowledge them. And I think that just a lot of people have had to learn the hard way, the value of it. I'm skeptical about your skepticism, Luke. Good. <laughs> you solved it. You win. <laughs> um, honestly, Starfield's engine isn't the problem. It's the story. I think there are plethora. Dare I say a plethora of problems with Bethesda. Should we do this? Should we do this now? New segment. There you go. Immediately, all the viewers leave. So, we're going to light our... BGS candle, okay? I should have an actual candle for BGS. Maybe I just put a picture of Todd. Hold on. I'm going to print out a picture of Todd. We're going to tape it to this. This is going to be our Todd handle. A uh, Todd candle. Todd handle. Todd Howard. Oh, can I do like as a saint? Yes, the saint picture. Open image, a new tab. Print. Okay. I think this will work. Okay. It's going to print out. We're going to put the Todd picture on the Todd candle. And then whenever we talk about Todd Howard, we are going to summon his spirit with the candle. Okay. We're going to get the cutout too. Okay. It's like a summoning ritual. Like we're summoning some sort of demonic spirit. But it's a game designer. I need to do some surgery on this cutout, by the way. He's seen better days. Oh, man. Okay, Todd, watch over us. Protect us. Okay. Um... Okay, behold. The patron St. Todd Howard picture. This is great, Jacob. You can just leave this in the clip. I think this is all, <laughs> this is preem content right here. Um, do I have like a, ooh, I do. Um... It's my little craft board. I use it for building Warhammer minis. Hooray! Am I top-down camera? Hold on, I have to refresh it. This is what you thought. You're like, oh, I'm gonna go watch Luke talk about games. No, you're gonna watch him do arts and crafts. Uh, rear cam, this one. There we go. Okay, so we're gonna just cut Mr. Todd right on out of there. So as we talk about Todd, he is with us in mind and spirit. I kind of hope one day that he pops into one of these streams or videos and it's just like, what on earth did I do in my career to cause crazy people to do stuff like this? He's like, I just make video games. Why, why do they do this? And then do we put the paper on the flammable thing? I think I'm going to have to cut off some of his chest. 
Put the paper on the flaming thing. Yeah, that works. Okay. Do I have tape? I have electrical tape. It'll work. Okay. Okay. Just wait. Just wait. This is all going to be great. It's not straight. I know. We'll manage. Just like most of us, it's not completely straight. It's okay. It's okay. It says the guy that's married with two kids. <laughs> Uh, take that, all those bullies in high school. Okay. Let's do this. There we go, Todd. And then you're going to just hug the candle. There. Now it's a Todd candle. <laughs> Isn't that great? Okay. Okay. Um... Luke, can you paint all your nails black? It looks hot. Dude, I wish this were a painted nail. I think the whole thing's about to pop off, actually. It's very close. It's, like, raised. It's pretty bad. It's pretty bad. I think my can my, my fingernail is dying. It's okay. Okay. So, I'll just set that there. Our Todd candle lit. Now we can discuss Todd and his many antics, okay? So, here's the deal, yo. Here's the dealio with, with Mr. Todd. There's a discussion that's ongoing within the BGS community right now that is hotly debated. And that is whether, like, what the, what the real issue is with BGS. Because everybody agrees that there's something off. There's something wrong that needs addressing. Starfield didn't live up to expectations. A lot of people found it disappointing, especially the more they played. Fallout 4 was sort of a mixed bag. Fallout 76, we don't even need to really discuss in much detail. Everybody already knows all the problems there. So something's wrong with BGS. And a lot of people are like, it's not the creation engine. It's the, uh, it's the writing. It's not the technology. It's actually the game designers that are stuck in days of old. Or other people are like, it's not any of that, it is just the creation engine. If they just had better technology, they would do uh, much better stuff. But I think it's it's sort of a mixed bag. It's tough to, to pin down. I think it's a mixture of all of them. So I think what we could do is we could kind of split this up into like, maybe we say um, it's the creation engine as one kind of option it's the writers, Retiers, uh, or we could say it's the design. These are probably the three most common frustrations and complaints people have with with BGS games. I mean, the, the first point with the creation engine is that I don't think anybody's going to argue that it's outdated. I, like, you look at anything that, that Starfield does or anything that Fallout 4 did or Fallout 76 did, and it is inferior to the competition. And I think that that holds it back. I, and I mean, even other things like the, um, the fact that it has a lot of like legacy code that hasn't been stripped out really holds it back too. We talked about this in the video I did on how modders have said that the floating point problem can't be easily enough fixed within Starfield to get rid of like the loading screen issue or the constant little fishbowl environments instead of a whole open universe or anything. And it's basically just because it, my understanding, and I mean, I'm sure people are going to correct me when I get some of this wrong, but my understanding with a lot of this is that how a lot of this works is that in the creation engine, what happens is that there's sort of a starting point X uh, if you imagine this whole frame or canvas as like a playable map, right? So there's X, which is where the player starts. It's the world instance. It's the zero comma zero. It's where everything begins, right? And then as you travel out from this, there's different levels of detail and fidelity that can be reached in terms of like placing objects, in terms of simulating stuff, especially within Starfield. And so the farther away from X that you get the less accurately it can pinpoint simulated locations, the less uh, accurately it can track player movements, things like that. It just starts to break down because it's all based on this and they use floats and things to, to um, 
uh, to store that data and communicate it back to other things that the engine is doing. And there have been ways that other studios have fixed this. The problem with Starfield is that this X is pretty much always your ship. So when you land on a planet, whether it's for uh, like New Atlantis or if it's on a planet you're just randomly exploring, this X point is where you land. And then everything spawns away from that and kind of cycles away from that as it procedurally generates. Um, in other games though, what they do is they either go to like 64 bit stuff and they, they solve the floating point problem in just by brute forcing it with more data, which is basically what they did with star citizen, where they can have an entire galaxy and have that fully simulated and never have this issue. Other studios, my understanding is that like, uh, the way Ubisoft does this is that the player character is always basically this point. So they're able to get around it that way. Um, it's very complicated. There's a lot of math involved with it. But one of the ways that this was represented was with, uh, it was like the Minecraft, um, like Faraway Lands or something. Yeah, the Far Lands. So there was an issue within, uh, not the Far Lands. Far lands Minecraft. Because Minecraft obviously is very, very heavily simulated and uh, everything is procedural. And what would basically happen is when you got too far away from that X point, simulations and procedural algorithms and stuff would just start to break. It just wouldn't work right. So you'd end up reaching these, what players ended up calling like the Far Lands which were just really bizarre formations that didn't make sense. They didn't really follow the same rules as the rest of the game. And it's basically just because prior to them patching it out and figuring out a fix for it, if you got too far away from that X point, the procedural algorithms would just break down. And this apparently is the same core issue behind Starfield's issues. Um, and it's because of the creation engine. It's just, uh, a hold back to days of old and it limits what they can do now for me if i were designing a game and i realized that we couldn't actually do a whole like crazy elaborate procedurally generated map because of our engine i would either be like okay we need to figure something else out or we need to to get new tech we need like different ideas whatever like if this is going to be all we can do we need to pivot but BGS, they heard all of these problems, all these limitations to the creation engine and what they could do with Starfield, and they chose to follow through on it anyways. And I think that that is a testament to potentially issues with the design, where they seem to um, settle for um, maybe for uh, underwhelming features maybe i don't know they're willing to accept that this isn't going to be as good as the competition but at least it's something so we can kind of sell it as being extra cool um why don't they just update it apparently it's very very difficult to fix that problem with the floating points and and or floats and with um that sort of world instant spawn. It requires a ton of rewriting and apparently BGS just doesn't want to do that. And this again i mean kind of goes back with this is that <clears throat> the creation engine has a lot of of strengths and weaknesses uh, a lot of people just point at the the weaknesses but they do have strengths such as you know the modding community um which as we all know tends to fix a lot of bgs's games and that's worth something right <laughs> Starfield's kind of the first time that the modding community has really not responded well to one of their games. And it's because there's a lot of core technical problems that make modding it very, very difficult. A lot of people were hoping that they'd be able to just mod an entire planet. And so you remember in the lead up to, to Starfield, a lot of people were like, oh, I'm not worried that there's a thousand planets and a lot of them are going to be empty because they're just going to be able to fill those with like, oh, this, this planet is Hoth. 
now. And this planet, I'm just going to create the whole Star Wars universe. There's like a mod pack that just adds in all the Star Wars planets. I'm going to go over here and, oh, it's the Dagobah system. And you can go meet a little Yoda at, at one of those planets. People were excited for that. But what they ended up getting was a series of tiny fish bowls stitched together into a shape resembling a planet. But it's just not... It's not what they were hoping for. It's not what they wanted. And um, so they ended up turning off a lot of their, their modding community because the coolest idea for modding Starfield ended up being impossible or at least so prohibitively time-consuming and overwhelming excuse me, to do that it just didn't make sense. They're like, I'll just go back to modding Fallout or Skyrim or whatever. So the modding community is a benefit of it. The other thing Todd has said um, that the creation engine offers them to do is that he says that it's very, very fast. He said they're able to build environments very, very quickly. He also has said that they are very um, like familiar with it. They, they really know it. And that's valuable because to switch engines would require tons of training and all sorts of headaches there. Um, but, but like, again, it's just at what point do these, these pros not outweigh the cons because there's other things that are, are cons such as, uh, graphical shortcomings, right? Shortcomings. There are all sorts of things like bugs that they still have had to deal with uh performance issues the creation engine does not run very well starfield ran better than pretty much any other Sky or uh bethesda game i've played at launch but still not saying much and i was playing it on like a very hefty computer which helped but it still has plenty of issues it's it's far from perfect um then you know there, there's just what are some other positives? I'm trying to think of other positives for it. Uh, the modding community speed, they know it. I don't know. Uh, there are systems. Um, so they have systems for like AI for, for their simulations, things like that, that would be tough. I'm sure to rewrite and move over to a new engine, but still it would be doable. Um, as for the writing, this is a consistent thing I've heard there was one positive i think with starfield which was that they had a cool idea for new game plus and that's the only positive i've heard everything else was like lazy quests the uh main quest for starfield was just a fetch quest um the characters are pretty one-dimensional Um, yeah, there, there's just, there, it's never been that compelling. It's never, it's never been that compelling. Um, creation engine all probably also deserves credit for the ability to maintain sense that this feels like a BGS game, positive or negative perhaps, but yeah, I, I guess you're right. It does have the, the Bethesda, Bethesda. Uh, what Mr. Matty plays called it was the Bethesda stank <laughs> is what he called it. He's like, they just, they have a scent to them. You can sense it from a mile away. You see a screenshot and you're like, that's a Bethesda game, you know? Um, Michael, thank you for the two. If CDPR changed, there's no reason Bethesda can't. Well, so this kind of leads us to the other thing. What, like, if we're looking at all of this, what is a reason for Bethesda to keep all of this? Um... I mean, let's also just say a positive. They own it. It's theirs. They don't have to pay for licensing. They don't have to pay for any extra tools. It saves time because again, moving over to a new engine would cost a lot of training time. They'd have to get the all the teams figured out. Um, beyond that, like a lot of their current assets, a lot of things that they've built for previous games, they'd have to start from scratch in a, a new engine. So there's a lot of reasons for them to be like, eh, eh. So it's just kind of rough. Um, but I think that a lot of this kind of leads to situations where well, I, I think a lot of it would just end up being more positive than negative. Um, because there's an old saying, it goes back to a 
a political strategist in the 1980s where he said that uh, perception is reality. And his whole idea with that very simple heuristic was that you should always evaluate perceptions as the reality such that you have to deal with those even if they aren't factually true. So in the context of politics, it was like, if everybody thinks that this political candidate is a, a liar or just compulsively lies, it doesn't matter if they actually are lying or not. It doesn't matter if you can demonstrate with like all the, the paper trails. No, they were telling the truth at every single thing they said. They've never told a lie. It doesn't matter. If everybody has the perception you're a liar, you have to deal with that If you, in the context of politics if you want it to be uh, successful because you're trying to convince people to vote for you. In the context of any general market, the same principle holds true. If everybody believes that yellow food coloring causes you to immediately acquire erectile dysfunction, if everybody believes that's the case, even if it is factually demonstrably not the case, you're gonna see companies removing yellow food coloring from their, their products because it's just not worth the trouble. Like. Why would they fight that? Why would they do like a whole education campaign when it's easier to just simply remove the coloring, right? And we've seen that. Kraft, uh, Kraft Mac and Cheese, there was, um, I believe it was the food babe. She's like a really wealthy woman who's very bored. <clears throat> and she's like a textbook, chemo uh, has chemophobia. She's terrified of all things chemical. And so she petitioned to have Kraft Mac and Cheese remove a certain food coloring from their mac and cheese. And Kraft was like, okay, it's not worth the trouble. We'll just use a different one. <laughs> so they just removed it, right? Um, and so it's all about dealing with the perception above and beyond the reality. The perception with Bethesda Game Studios is that they have a, an engine that's very broken, that's very outdated, and can't compete with the competitors no matter what. They also have a problem with the writers where a lot of people feel like um, the current writing staff over at Bethesda is basically tenured and no longer has the spark or fire. They never did a particularly amazing job, but they're just kind of going through the motions now. And all of the, the concepts that they've come up with in the last decade have been pretty underwhelming. The one exception to that, I think Skyrim worked pretty well, but even with Skyrim, like it is a, a very, it's a very simplistic RPG, if you can even call it that, like it's much more, um, it's much more, I've called them sandbox games before. I've also called them junk food games because it's kind of like popcorn. Like it might give you a little bit of taste, a little bit of something to work with, but it's not anything substantive. Like it's not going to actually change your, your, uh, you know, muscle mass or help you in any significant way. There's not a lot of nutrients there. It's just junk food. And that's kind of Skyrim. Like you think back to Skyrim and some of the missions and quests, like you show up to the, the magic college winter hold or whatever it's called. And you just walk in, you do like a couple missions. And in the span of like 45 minutes, you're now the head of the entire school. <laughs> and they're just like, yep, congratulations. There you go. And it's like when you're a toddler or a young kid and you're playing and you're just like, yes, and I now am king. And you put on the helmet or the, the helmet, the crown. Like, I am king now. Everybody's Isa like, Abdul he said Nur it. Donated five you know? Jordanian dinars through Super Chat. Thank you. Masochist here with 300 plus Starfield hours. I'm so sorry. It made me cherish games that outdo what it attempts, highlighting its lazy implementation on decent ideas. Yeah, and I think that that's generally the... Um, yeah, then you proceed to delete all other guilds. I think that's generally the frustration with um Joachim Pedersen is now a member. Joachim, thank you. I'm sorry I mispronounced your name so bad. Uh but thank you. 14 months. Oh baby. Um yeah, I think the general perception is that that's just it's just very lazy. And at this point that's kind of the the perception everybody has after this. So like if we break all of this down and if we just say, okay, we um we break that. If we go changing engines, okay? Maybe UE5, maybe something else, who knows? They contact Gorilla, get access to, to Decimo, whatever. Who knows? Um, but, which now couldn't happen, let's just be clear, because they're owned by Xbox, but still. 
Um, whatever engine they go. Probably, let's just be real, probably UE5. Okay, let's just be perfectly honest about that. The, the cost is a big problem. They're going from owning something to having to pay royalties basically on the, the next engine. That's that's a negative. That's something that's significant. Now that they're owned by Xbox, I think margins are less important, but still that's something to consider. Um, there's also added costs in the form of time. They have to train their staff. Um, they have to do, you know, time to transition. Um, because there's all sorts of like assets that have to be changed over. They're going to have to probably completely rework their their daily workflow. The producers are going to have to restructure how they do things. You know, are they going to be using some of the free assets? Are they going to be hiring outside companies to help develop assets? There's all sorts of things um, that have to be considered and, you know, thrown together like this. Other negatives, um, you know, the mods may be harder to implement okay so that's that's something where the creation engine kit is something their modding community knows very very well so that could be a negative um what else other cons i don't know i'll we'll, we'll come back to that if we think of any positives graphical improvements immediately i mean it just huge huge leap forward in terms of fidelity you also would potentially see i say potentially because uh like we've seen plenty of of ue games that are not stable but there's the potential for stability increases i still think the unreal engine 5 has better overall stability than the creation engine based on the things that i've seen and played um it still can be done poorly. You can still have games that run poorly that are Unreal Engine games, but I still think it's probably better than Creation Engine. Uh, beyond that, I think you also, pro I mean, I, I would have to imagine that if BGS moved over, I think they'd have Epic's backing um, in the same way that, that CDPR seemingly has their backing. And I mean, this is the other thing with all of this like cdpr did it and the one thing everybody says is that cdpr is always cutting edge when it comes to graphics um outside of the launch <laughs> window but cyberpunk 2077 was one of the most graphically impressive games of all time with the form of uh, the 2.0 update um even 1.4 was amazing but the phantom liberty expansion when they had the full ray tracing stuff it is an amazing set of Technology. I mean, it's, it's just a fascinating collection of different tools and proprietary stuff from NVIDIA. It's wild. And they chose to walk away from those tools and go to CDP or, or go to uh, Epic and use Unreal Engine 5. And that should tell you just how impressed they were with Unreal Engine. You know, it's, it, I mean, that's a big deal. That's huge. That's huge. So I think that that's something to consider as well. Uh, mods would be easier in Unreal Engine 5, in my opinion, since so many more people have knowledge of UE5. It's as close to industry standard as a game engine can get. I mean, that's also true. That's also true. I mean, the one reason I heard somebody at a GDC talk, they said that they uh, the reason they chose to use the Unreal Engine for their studio, it was like a smaller indie studio, was because when people leave college and after they've been trained in school, Moving to a company that uses Unreal Engine is the easiest way to do it because they've all been training with Unreal Engine through school. So they're already familiar with it. Whereas if you're using a proprietary tool set, you have to learn that separately and it's a whole other thing, you know? So that's that's something to consider. The other, the other piece to this too is that um, the creation engine has a bad rep. It really does. I mean, you look at any trailer for Starfield from the moment it was announced. People said, oh God, they kept the creation engine. People are saying now for the Elder Scrolls 6, if they're keeping the creation engine, they're screwed. It just has a bad reputation. And as I said earlier, I think for this stuff, perception is reality. And I think if the perception is that the creation engine is holding them back a ton, they got to deal with that.
that's what they got to deal with. So I think that that switching over, getting rid of creation engine shows flexibility. I think it shows that they are willing to grow and change, even if it means leaving behind a tool set that they've used for decades at this point. Um, so I think that that's, that's certainly something to, uh, to consider. Um, and honestly, like this is perhaps the biggest reason to do it. I, I think the creation engine at this point is just anathema. Like people hear it and are just, ugh. they're just not loving it. Um, yeah, if we're talking about coders, Scott, yeah, of course they come from everywhere. A uh, guy I know, he was working as a software engineer for, um, it was like Ford. I think it was like, he never was able to say, but it was like early, early stages of like the Ford electric vehicles and stuff. But he moved from there and now he's working with like Ubisoft and their engine team or something like that. Um, but when we're talking about like environmental artists, when we're talking about combat designers and stuff, those guys, when they're in school, they're trained on creation engine. <clears throat> um, what's better UE4 or creation engine? Um, I mean, it's not necessarily a matter of better. They're just different. Like there are pros, as I've said to the creation engine, there's reasons that Bethesda would want to keep it. There's reasons for it. Um, there's also reasons that people really don't like it, that it's a negative, that it seems to hold them back. And I think the consistent thing we've seen with BGS is that there is a broader perception that they are unwilling to change and adapt to modern times and that they are falling further and further behind the competition. Because as we've seen these huge leaps forward, especially in terms of tech from Gorilla Games, from, um, from CDPR, even from Ubisoft, some of the stuff they're able to do with their scalar tech is just crazy and mind blowing. But BGS is still making games that feel like they could be running on the, the PS4. The only thing about Starfield that feels next generation is that the load times are pretty fast. There's still thousands of them, but at least they're pretty fast, you know? Yeah. Um, well, Master, the one thing with Unreal Engine 3, my understanding is that the version of Unreal Engine that Rocksteady used <clears throat> for Batman Arkham Knight was heavily modified it was not uh there was like a gdc talk where one of them said um that it, it was almost unrecognizable but i mean i don't think they showed anybody how altered it was but it seemed that their version of unreal engine was running very very differently um than what you would get like out of the box but the point is like if you have Epic's backing, which if Bethesda Game Studios, CD Projekt Red are doing deals with Epic, they're working with them to design tools. And this is what they said when they announced it. Um, maybe I can find the original clip. Uh, UE5 CDPR. When they announced that they were moving over, they said that they were excited to work next to Epic Games to design the next generation of tools for open world adventure games and stuff. So they were saying very openly, yeah, we're going to be working with Epic to design and basically make our very specific version of Unreal Engine that works for our types of games. Let's see if this is it. It's an open world game design with The Witcher 3 and Cyberpunk 2077 combining freedom of exploration with compelling storytelling in unparalleled fashion. Through a new partnership with Epic, CD Projekt Red is building a brand new Witcher saga with UE5. Our cooperation with Epic has just started. It was uh, the shift towards uh, open world support that brought Unreal Engine 5 to our attention. So there was one demo uh, that happened last year that was the medieval environment demo where at one point uh, there's a notice board that looks strangely familiar to things we've done in the past that has even a sign that says Monster Slayer Wanted. And I'm like, hmm. Are they are they trying to tell us you know come come over to Unreal Engine look how great your games can look on there is was that was that whole demo made with that nefarious purpose I don't know but it definitely definitely caught my eye. This opens a new chapter for us where we really want to see how our experience in building open world games gets combined with all the engineering power of Epic. 
One of the things that is really important to keep in mind when, when talking about open world games versus, let's say, more linear games is the possibilities of the things that can go wrong or the, 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 the scenarios that you have to consider are exponentially higher than linear games. Players can go in whatever direction that they want. They can handle content in, in, in any order that they want, theoretically. And to really encapsulate that means that you need a really stable environment where you can be able to make changes with a high level of confidence that it's not going to break in 1,600 other places down the line. Unreal Engine is like a, a toolbox which has a lot of features, a lot of solutions already there that allow teams to just try new stuff. The fact that Unreal is used by a lot of teams already in the world, a lot of perspectives are projected into the design of the tools, and that helps the tool to be way more agile. So all in all, it's a really, really cool technology to like prototype and make environments really quickly, really beautiful, and very realistic. Epic and CD Projekt Red are the two companies that, that really want to achieve something great. We won't stop just, you know, by uh, developing some features. We, we won't stop there, yeah? We will continue to, to work together to achieve something extraordinary in the end. Continue to work together to achieve something, achieve something extraordinary in the end. He's the CTO. I mean, this is the guy that probably is directly responsible for CD Projekt moving over to Unreal Engine. I mean, he's the the guy that's deciding what tech they use and why they use it and how they use it. So he's the one that would uh, be making this big decision. And so if CDPR is looking at it and is saying, this makes a lot of sense, let's check it out. That's, I mean, that's that should tell you something. That should really tell you something. Because I think everybody agrees and I mean, maybe we can find one person that, that doesn't. Did I close my notes? No, I didn't. Um, I think everybody kind of agrees that we probably have like, uh, what was it? The red engine. I should do this in red, shouldn't I? The red engine. Ooh engine there we go and people say that the red engine is probably above the creation engine right people are like yeah it's probably superior graphically technologically i mean everything they were able to do in cyberpunk was amazing witcher 3 is amazing so red engine is probably better than that but the fact that cdpr considered what ue5 was capable of to be superior to what they were able to do, or at least what they were reasonably able to do with the same resources and money and budgets and everything. What does that say about the creation engine? <laughs> I mean, if they're still holding back and refusing to, to consider going over, it's just crazy to me. Um, so all of this to say, like, it's, it's just not, uh, my brain is fried. I think that there's pros and cons to each, to keeping it, to changing engines. But I think that there's a lot more pros to, to partnering with Epic and choosing to move over. Maybe there are new licensing things. Maybe there's things behind the scenes that make this more complicated and not as simple. Maybe CDPR has a deal where it's like, yeah, you can't partner with any other huge company to share the tools we're making um, for the Witcher games. You can't share those with Bethesda or with anybody else that partners with you. Maybe that's it. Who knows? There's probably a lot of stuff behind the scenes that get factored into this. But I do still think that the creation engine is such an albatross around their necks. It's such a a, a ball and chain holding them back. Um, that at this point, it's just not just for, for PR sake, not just because it has a really bad reputation, but also just because I think... Um, their tool sets have demonstrated for at this point two full releases back to back that their tool set is just not capable of keeping up with their ideas and at that point maybe look elsewhere you know i brought this up a while back i'm just worried all games will start to feel the same if everyone moves to unreal engine 5 i think that that's fair i mean a lot of games probably will start to get samey and the the prediction from a lot of people that are much smarter than me has been that we're probably going to see a good number of like indie games or double A games that look graphically phenomenal that end up being garbage. 
but they'll look amazing, right? And I, I think we, we haven't quite seen that yet, but I think we're going to see that in the next few years where we're going to see games where we're like, oh my God, this is an indie studios? What? This is an indie? What? It's going to blow your mind, but you're going to get the game and it's going to be like, okay, so it's basically just a really pretty walking simulator and that's about it. You know, I, I think we're going to see that type of thing a lot. Um, so I, I do think there will be growing pains like that, but I also think that it's at the end of the day, the, um, I, I think the, the good games will still flow to the top. Like they just generally do. Um, yeah, not all studios will switch. There's reasons to also consider other engines as well. It mainly depends on what kind of game you're looking to make, what your margins are. All of that stuff has to factor into this. It's not a, a one size fits all consideration. You know, there's some answers that make more sense than others um, based on what you're doing. Like if you're making a 2D game, it might not make sense to invest heavily into like the, or it's like a super linear 2D game. It might not make sense to invest super heavily into Unreal Engine for your team. It might make more sense to look at something like Unity. Um, same with like mobile games. I've heard mobile games very, very commonly built on Unity. So it's not a, a given for everybody that one engine is going to be best for anybody, but still. Um, are there any other realistic options for engines? I mean, now that they are within the, I mean, they're within the ZeniMax umbrella, they're within the Microsoft umbrella. If they wanted to partner with another one of their sister studios and share technologies, they probably could. Um, I would imagine just like, you know, when Kojima partnered with Guerrilla Games to get the Decima engine for Death Stranding. Granted, that was still under the PlayStation umbrella, but now he's going to be using that technology, presumably, to be building other non-PlayStation games. So I think the sister studio thing is the one option where they might be able to go over to somebody else who's built games and other engines or proprietary engines. But we'll see. Um... I'm hoping Capcom uses the RE engine for a while still. I still have a good rig that can max out most games on it. It's so good. Yeah, well, I mean, they're going to keep cranking it, keep tweaking it, I bet. Um, okay, I guess we can do this. Cry engine, Lumberyard, Star engine would be rentable in some time or will be rentable in some day, time. It would be a good one. Yeah, I just don't know how that would work for RPGs and stuff. Maybe great. I don't know. Luke, you were right about Rise of the Ronin. I beat the game and it's still, or it's just a clone side. It's just cloned side content and dead NPCs everywhere. Exploration is horrible. You're better off chasing map markers. Definitely not worth 70 bucks. Yeah. I, I hate to say I told you so, but I mean... <laughs> I was telling you guys for months, it's like Rise of the Ronin, it just looks stinky to me. There's just something about it. And we did videos and live stream segments pointing out all the things that I thought were weird and red flags about that game. And many people were like, yeah, it seems weird. Other people were like, uh, no, you're just nitpicking and stuff. And then we get the game. And it's like, okay, well maybe, maybe there was something there, but whatever. Um, it's, I still think like it's a game that appeals to the types of people that like Team Ninja games. Like if you like Team Ninja games, you're not going to care that much about graphics. You're not going to care that much about the open world stuff. You're just there for the combat and the boss fights and stuff. And that's fine. I mean, you can still have a good time with it. My, my point is when you add in an open world, when you add in side quests, when you add in that stuff, that has to be evaluated too. We can't just look at a sliver of the game. Because I've, I've gotten comments on that as well where people are telling me, um, you know, probably people that are giving it some of the good user scores and they're like, uh, well, Luke, you just need to not do the side quests and you need to not do the open world stuff. Just go through the story and the boss fights. Like you're telling me to not play half the game. And at what point should we consider that to be a negative? <laughs> like, I think that should come into consideration. If you're telling me to skip parts of it, that's a problem, isn't it? Yeah. The, like the game is, it's pretty good if you ignore half of it. Okay. Okay. 
I also, so guys, I was going to try to do like a whole segment on the Shattered Space DLC for Starfield. I can't find like any information on it. Like none. All they've really shown is like the picture Shattered Space. First story expansion. And that's it. Like there really is not any significant info on Shattered Space. So the end of the year blog labels the DLC as a major expansion and confirms that it'll add new story content, new locations, new gear, and much more. Players on Reddit are speculating that the Varun Starfield faction might be a major play or major player in the new story content, given that they appeared less in the base game. Um, but like, there's really not much <laughs> to go with here. Like, okay, that, but I've, I've dug around. I've tried to find more information on it, but there just isn't any. It's tough. I'm like, I would have thought we have, would hear a couple tidbits about it or something, but no. There's just nothing. There might be, I mean, it might be huge. It might have a ton more content. Who knows? But at, at, at this point, it's just kind of weird. There's, there's really not anything known about it. I would imagine it's big because like Fallout 4 in comparison, Fallout 4 by this point in the release schedule, it had already released Far Harbor and they were on their way to releasing Nuka World. So like they had released a lot and Starfield has gotten basically nothing and we still know nothing about Shattered Space. So my hope is that Shattered Space is like a huge 15, 20 hour expansion. That's just a ton of stuff. And I hope it is because they've been very, very quiet, but it's just weird how quiet they are. You know? Um, <laughs> the DLC is being procedurally generated right now. Be patient. <laughs> yeah, they're running the simulations now. Um, yeah, man. I, if they did like a next gen update, that could actually be something which would be really funny because it launched on current gen. But like, you know how they did the next gen updates for like cyberpunk and when they did that it made everything run at like 60 frames and everything ran way better and the ai was fixed and all that like that was a great marketing gimmick because it's like okay this is the next step it's the evolution of the game you play it and sure enough it feels way better so they did like a next gen update where it's like yeah we got rid of pretty much all the load screens it's instantaneous you just click it you go through and then we also got it running 60 on consoles i think that would be a great a great way to get some excitement for the game again. But there just really has not been a whole lot of communication on it. So hopefully they're just working hard on it. But like I was ready to go and do a deep dive into it and like, okay, this is what they've said. This is maybe what it means and this and that. Nope. Nope. There's just nothing. They're like, yep, we're doing a, a big expansion. They say it's the first story expansion. I mean, when I hear first that implies there's going to be a second story expansion. So if this is coming like a full year after launch, presumably, is the next one going to be two years after launch? Like they're just going to take a year for each of these. They've said they're going to support it long term, but I don't know how many people are that stoked on Starfield expansions. I mean, maybe it's that good. Maybe it's so good that you're like, oh, my God, give me another one. We'll see. Could they just say they aren't doing it anymore? Technically, yes. There have been other companies that have abandoned DLC and season pass content. It's usually a really bad look and you have to give stuff up. You have to try and make amends for it. You're still probably going to get sued. It's probably, it's honestly probably cheaper to still just release it. Especially they've been working on it for like six months at least. So still probably cheaper. Did they ever fix? Yeah, they're adding the Joker. <laughs> they're adding the Jonkler. Um, did they ever fix Redfall? Do, does anybody know? Next gen update is just going to be called Starfield 2. Putting a next gen update on this 
thing is like putting tinsel on a dead Christmas tree. <laughs> Game's already flawed. There's nothing to save. That's that's a funny image. It's better now. Look. That's, okay, that's funny. Um, Liam, thank you for the super chat. Crazy how Microsoft owns so many studios and haven't created their own in-house engine. All they've done is sent developer um, sent a developer suicide squad to assist. I mean, I don't know if it makes sense for them to have like a big in-house engine. Um, I mean, maybe it does. I, I just, I'm not sure that makes sense because each of the studios has their own tool sets. They're all happy doing their own thing. I don't think they need to tweak it or change anything. Um, cause like all you would end up doing is basically having an EA situation where you're forcing everybody to use frostbite. And we all know how that went with like mass effect Andromeda. Didn't then do great. Microsoft just created an Unreal team for improving Unreal tech across all their teams. Yes, I mean, they're, it's, uh, that would at least imply that they're trying to um, encourage maybe shifting towards that. Um, Yeah, to complete, compete with UE5 would be so expensive. Well, and it would take so long. It would take billions. And years. And by the time you catch up to them, they probably have advanced even further. Like, it probably just doesn't make sense. Um, Okay, let's let's touch on this real quick. Because we, we were just talking about CD Projekt. We were talking about, like, Bethesda and the creation engine and all that stuff. But... Cyberpunk and Witcher Studio CD Projekt Red, quote, doesn't see a place for microtransactions in single player games. The issue of in-game payments has come under fresh scrutiny recently after players criticized Capcom for including purchasable items in Dragon's Dogma 2, which would allow them to fast travel or edit their character for real money. That resulted in the RPG, which received glowing pre-release reviews, launching to mixed reviews on Steam. Just 40% of the first 10,000 ratings were positive. This has since shifted to about 57%. Um, speaking to stockwatch.pl via Juicehead, CD Projekt's CFO, Nielu Bowix, maybe, suggested it would not adopt a similar stance in its future games. We do not see a place for microtransactions in the case of single player games, he said, but we do not rule out that we will use the solution in the future case of multiplayer projects. Yeah, because allegedly they're working on like a multiplayer cyberpunk game and some other stuff so uh I, I would imagine that they're gonna have some sort of uh, some form of monetization there which just makes sense um in the case of all this i mean it, it's good to see my impression of the dragon's dogma 2 microtransaction thing is that that was a capcom from on high you have to put microtransactions or have dlc day one because pretty much every capcom game has microtransactions i mean even like or I guess paid DLC, because microtransactions apply or implies that they're available in-game, like through an in-game store, and these aren't. But even like, um, ju -ju -ju -ju, even a super overwhelmingly positive game, a game that people just devoured on Steam. I mean, you can see overwhelmingly positive. Guess what this launched with? like a bunch of paid DLC. And these are like weapon exclusive upgrade tickets. These are gold attache cases. These are, you know, treasure maps. These are costumes, <laughs> like all sorts of things. Okay. Like Capcom has done this with some of their biggest games ever. For whatever reason, Dragon's Dogma 2 is the one people decided to get really upset about. Um, but to me, it seems like the games are really, really good by themselves, which is why reviewers have reviewed them without any microtransactions or buying any of this. They just review them purely by themselves. And the games get glowing reviews as a result. And then it seems like this is just Capcom telling them you need to have some form of monetization. You have to have DLC available. Um, 
So, because there's some people that will always just hit this add to cart for the DLC bundles. They just always do. I know it's weird, but there are people that will do it. And so they're like, yeah, just put that stuff in there. Easy peasy. Not everybody's going to buy it. Most people won't, but some people will, and that's worth it. So that's my impression of it is that this was Capcom being Capcom. And for whatever reason, gamers decided to now get upset about it when they didn't get upset last year with Resident Evil 4, but we're getting upset about it now. You know, the problem was the bait and switch. I mean, I think they like even with Resident Evil 4 remake, they didn't communicate that they were having like day one paid um, DLC on it, except for like the pre-order stuff. But all that was also like, as far as I'm aware, was also communicated before the launch of Dragon's Dogma 2. Um, I just think like for whatever reason, it, the, the story hooked on this time. I remember people talking about the paid DLC with with Resident Evil 4 Remake back when that launched, uh, but it was like five or six people that were talking about it in various communities. Um, it really did not hook, but for Dragon's Dogma 2, I think paired with the technical performance, it made a much more compelling story. So it all just kind of spun and spun and got bigger and bigger. Um, so, like my stance is if you wanna boycott games for, for having paid DLC day one, uh, as single player games, more power to you. That's, you know, I, I can't argue with that. Um, I think it should be called out. I think it should be criticized. I just, I'm so sick and tired of boycotting every single thing that slightly upsets us that I'm kind of, uh, for one, I'm not convinced boycotts work. And two, um, to me, this seems like a studio that was trying to follow the rules of Capcom, the big multi-billion dollar publisher, and they made a really good game that they had to put microtransactions on to satisfy, satisfy and satiate the big multi-billion dollar publisher. And um, so, I mean, they made a great game, which is all we really cared about, you know? Yeah, they don't work, especially look at Hogwarts Legacy. Yeah, I mean, Hogwarts Legacy, I think, is a, an example of an instance where boycotts actually probably helped that game, which is really funny. Because I, I know for a fact, I know like two or three people that said they were buying multiple copies of Hogwarts Legacy just so they could like say screw you to the people that were most upset about it, which I find really funny. <laughs> yeah, it's just like, nice try! <laughs> but hey, it happens. Um... Okay, this, today is a day. This is not April Fool's. Well, it is April Fool's today, but this is not an April Fool's story. Jim Ryan's gone, everybody. Light the, the funeral pyre, the Todd Howard candles burning. Uh, Jim Ryan's gone. The, the Wicked Witch of the West is gone. And now there's a new player in town. Hiroki Totoki. He officially begins his role as interim CEO of PlayStation starting today. Jim Ryan's last day was yesterday, or I guess Friday, technically. Um, he's left the company. He is retiring, going back to the UK, I suppose. And this guy's taking over now. So what is his deal? What's his deal? What should you know about him? Because usually whenever there's a new interim CEO or new leadership in any company, there's going to be changes. There's going to be shifts. Um, and the board of directors usually puts in an interim CEO or a new leader for very particular and specific reasons. In the case of this guy, he is known for being obsessive over margins, which makes sense. I mean, he's the Sony president, COO, and CFO. He's in charge of money and he's in charge of operations. He knows his, his stuff, okay? So he um, has a ton of power within Sony, and he's been put in this position by the board of directors because he's hyper fixated on margins. And guess what PlayStation's biggest problem has been for this generation? Margins. And a big problem because uh, just in case you are, you, you don't know, um, because not everybody is finance inclined. That is perfectly fine. Basically how most of this works 
in super simplistic terms, if you sell this much of something, okay, this could be a hundred. I don't know what that was supposed to be. If this is a hundred dollars and then you come in here and you're like, wow, I made a hundred dollars. This is just your revenue. Okay. Revenue is just the money that comes in. It doesn't tell you how much you actually made in profit. It's just revenue. Okay. What you actually should care about are your margins and how much of this is actual profit. Because if you had to spend, let's say $95 to get that hundred dollars. So you bought a product for 95, you sold it to somebody for a hundred, you only made five bucks in profit. It's still five bucks, but that's a much less profitable venture than say if you actually managed to um, do that at a much wider margin. So say it costs you $50 and then you make $50 in profit. This is a much better situation and everybody would rather be here. So PlayStation's problem is that this margin, which is kind of the, the gap between total revenue and basically tells you how much your profit is on each of these things. PlayStation's problem is that this has been shrinking. So as the years have gone by, this has gone from like 50 or this line, this gray line of margin has been shifting tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. And part of the reason for that is because of Jim Ryan's consistent focus on trying to double down on live service games because when you're looking at an overall company you kind of have to like you have to know accounting you have to know how to read the books and stuff because you could see this calculated just on an individual games basis so you could see that um say for for something like uh hell divers you know they they their margin is extremely wide they might have only spent you know for each hundred dollars made maybe they just spent five bucks and they're making $95 in profit all over here. That's not indicative of how the broader company is working though, right? What you need to do is you need to look at the margins for the entire business to give you broad trends and an idea of how profitable the business as a whole operation is. And that's where my, uh, PlayStation is in big trouble because their margins are only about 6%. So, you know, if every $100 made, they're only making about six in profit, which is rough. Okay, so um, what what PlayStation's doing is that they've spent for years hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars on games that go nowhere or are canceled. The Last of Us Online game, they spent hundreds of millions of dollars on that by most accounts, and it went nowhere. It's not making a single penny. Okay, so they are... It, they're in big trouble. I mean, they're, they're in big, big trouble um, because that shrinks these margins even further because down here in this lower half or this lower portion is where all of your expenses lie. And so you can kind of think of it as like, you know, you got your big bucket of all the money that came in, which is the black box. But the more uh, expenses you have, the fuller this tank gets and the less air is left at the top. And... PlayStation has had a lot of expenses. A lot of stuff has gone into this tank to leave less and less air at the top, which is the opposite of how it's supposed to work. As console generations go by, you're supposed to see this line dropping and you're supposed to see margins increasing. You're supposed to go from about $5 every $100 made in revenue um, at the start of a generation and by the end of the generation, or, or rather by halfway through the generation, you're supposed to be at about 20%, according to Sony's CFO. You're supposed to be at about 20, or by an analyst, rather. Um, you're supposed to have about 20% margin. They don't have that. They don't have that. Um, so this guy is coming in and is saying, we're going to fix that. We're going to change it up. PlayStation's going to get broad margins. We're going to cut the fat and we're going to figure it out. What does that actually mean in a day-to-day -day sense or for Sony's broader strategy? For one, means a whole heck of a lot more of PlayStation's games are coming to PC. He's been very clear about this. They see a huge opportunity for basically free money to just bring 
PlayStation games to PC because they don't have to redevelop it. They just hire a company to kind of rework it and port it, which is comparatively very cheap compared to, you know, doing a standalone game. Um, and by doing that, they get to double dip into sales. They get the PlayStation fan base that buys their exclusives. And then they also get PC gamers that buy it. Easy money. Why not do that? So he's going to double down on that. As for exactly how that looks, it's not super clear right now. It could mean that he does that like day one. I don't think that's the case. I, For example, like I don't think if they announce The Last of Us Part 3, I don't think it's coming to PlayStation and PC on the same day. I think they release it on PlayStation and then like six months or a year later, they'll bring it to PC. But I think you're going to start to see a lot of Sony's back catalog coming. I think it's possible you see like if the licensing allows, you'll see like a Bloodborne come to uh, to PC. You're going to see um, more spinoff games come to, to PC. Pretty much anything that is exclusive and a big seller for PlayStation, they're going to try to bring over because it just makes sense. And that's going to be planned during the development process. So hopefully it becomes more of a fine-tuned, well-oiled machine of just consistently pumping these games out and getting them onto um, the PC platform. Because again, it's just easy money. You don't have to redevelop the game, but you get to sell it like it is a new game. So I think we see that. You're going to see lots of PlayStation fanboys probably upset about it, but what are you going to do? Cry me a river. Um, Totoki said that he wants Sony to be, quote, aggressive when it comes to improving the games or gaming division's profit margins, which he says can partly be achieved with a greater focus on first party games on PC. Um, addressing a question asking why the game division had been seeing an increase in gross income, but not in profits, Totoki made it clear that he feels releasing games multi-platform, which he seemingly clarified as meaning PC, continues to be the way moving forward. It, quote, in the past, we wanted to popularize consoles and a first party titles. Main purpose was to make the console popular, he explained. This is true, but there's a synergy to it. So if you have strong first party content, not only on our console, but on other platforms like computers or PCs, uh, a first party game can be grown with multi-platform and can help operating profit to improve. So that's another one we want to proactively work on. I personally think there are opportunities out there for uh, improvement of margin. So I would like to be more aggressive on improving our margin performance. Um, during the same call, Totoki said that Bungie could be better at, quote, assuming responsibility for its development timelines. It's kind of throwing shade at them. I visited the Bungie studios and had meetings with the management and saw employees working at the studios were highly motivated, showing the great creativity as well as an impressive knowledge of live services. However, I also felt that there was room for improvement from a business perspective with regard to areas such as the use of business expenses and assuming accountability for development timelines. I hope to continue the dialogue and come up with some good solutions. Basically, he doesn't want games to continue to suffer delays. He wants games to come out more consistently. He uh, doesn't want to waste money on projects that don't go anywhere. So I would fully expect to see in the coming months, maybe an announcement of further cancellations of some of Jim Ryan's babies, some of the Jim Ryan live service games that he was working on. I think you're going to see probably fewer projects greenlit fewer like experimental projects at least in the short term and i think they're just going to try and tighten up budgets across the board so you're probably going to hear about like all sorts of i mean i i don't i don't know if this is a guy that like likes crunch or wants to encourage crunch but i, I think you'll start to see um a lot of like penny pinching and they're going to find ways to trim as much fat as possible whether more layoffs come I, I would guess that's probably pretty likely because I think he's going to look at studios and be like, okay, if this game is going to make money, why are we developing it? Let's cancel it. And then the team, you guys don't have anything to work on. Okay. You all are gone. I think you're probably going to keep seeing stuff like that happen. Um, he probably has the closest eye on Bungie of all though. Bungie, I, I think has a lot of pressure on them. They were an incredibly expensive acquisition and they have returned <laughs> almost nothing for it. So I think he's going to be keeping a very close eye on them, but yeah, this guy is going to shape the end of the PS5 gen as far as we can tell, because even if he's only in this role for like a couple months or a few months, he's going to be instrumental in picking who takes over for the PS6 gen. So this guy 
is the one that's going to kind of head up this whole thing. And I've already done a video on Luke Stevens Live covering my conspiracy theory. I think Jim Ryan was probably encouraged to retire. I think this guy started doing an analysis of the margins and the profitability of PlayStation when he took over as CFO in like March of 2023. And I think they found that Jim Ryan's management of PlayStation was confused and expensive and wasteful. And I think he was like, you should probably leave. I think it's best if we just parted ways. And so I think Jim Ryan was encouraged to retire or maybe he, he sensed the blood in the water. He's like, okay, somebody's coming for me. They're not happy with how I've been running it. I'm going to get out before I get fired. And, uh, he retired peacefully. I, I that's my that's my personal conspiracy theory. That's my theory. Okay. There's not a lot of, of, uh, evidence pointing this way or that way, but it seems to make sense to me. The timelines are too close for it to just be purely coincidental that he takes over as COO starts doing evaluations of all of the company's operations, finds PlayStation very lacking. And he's very outspoken at how much he's not impressed with how PlayStation's been operated. And then Jim Ryan announces he's retiring. And then the flood of cancellations come in. They canceled the last of us online project. They cancel all these other things. They lay off an entire studio in London. Like all these things happen right about the same time. Like, okay. I don't think that was a coincidence, but that's just me. I, I think that he's probably the, the person that they need. I mean, I know PlayStation seems to be operating just fine. But the way one analyst described it on Wall Street that I was reading a, an article on, he described it as a violently ill company. He said, like many illnesses or cancers in a, a living person, often they lie dormant and you don't realize how sick they are until it's too late. He said that PlayStation is a business within Sony that is very, very sick and that needs a violent doctor. And... He said, I think this guy, Hiroki Totoki, is the violent doctor that's going to cut it open and rip the infection out. It's probably going to be messy. It's going to be aggressive. But you'll probably see some major changes. So that's my guess of what's going to happen. I, I think he's going to get in there. We're going to see more layoffs, a lot of cancellations. But he's going to try to uh, clean it up. Rizzler donated three dollars. Thank I'm you. I'm surprised you ain't talking about Half-Life 3 teaser. Considering the date, I'm not biting that. That's bait. That's bait. You want me to Google it? It's April 1st. <laughs> There's no way. <laughs> Even if there is, is a trailer, it's not real. I refuse to buy it. Um... Yeah, Jesus, it's video games. Uh, it's it's business. These guys have millions and millions and even billions on the line. So they're looking at Sony. They are like, hey, there's a lot of problems here, and they're gonna they're gonna get in there and try to clean it up. Um, <laughs> fair play to that guy. They got me. Oh, did you Google it? That's funny. <laughs> what do you think the odds are that PlayStation games actually go to PC day one? I think it depends on the game. I don't think that Sony's like third person adventure first party games go day one. Like I don't think the next God of War goes to PC day one. I don't think the last of us would go on to PC day one. Cause to me, I think if you are a fan of those types of games from PlayStation, you probably also own a PS five, even if you own a PC. And so they want to sell you that copy. And then in six months or a year, when they release the next one, they're going to just double sell it to you. Like they'll get you to buy another copy. And I think that that's their goal. And they probably kept track of it and they've been evaluating it. And they're like, okay, when we release it too close together, then we don't get the double dippers because they're like, I just played it six months ago. So I'm not going to buy it on PC. Whereas if it's enough time that somebody could justify playing through it again, then you usually get the double dip. So I, I still think it's probably like, okay, uh, uh, like say Ghost of Tsushima 2 is coming out in fall of 2025 and in 2026 we're going to bring the PC port I think that's probably where you see it maybe they don't release maybe they don't announce the PC port day one or as part of the announcement because then you're going to end up with people that 
are intentionally not buying it because they're waiting for the PC port. Because already people are saying they're going to do that with GTA 6. People are like, oh, I'm not going to buy it on console. I'm going to wait a year or two and play it on PC. I'll believe it when I see it. But I think a lot of people will still buy it. Um, Last of Us Part 2 doesn't have a PC port yet, though. Yeah, I, I would bet you good money they're working on it. And I think it's going to drop pretty close to the Season 2. Uh, that's what I think they're going to do. I mean, it just makes sense, right? Like... If you can just have a port, a PC port ready, release it for 70 bucks and probably also do like a, a, whatever they like anniversary edition or follow the light edition or whatever they end up calling it. But it's a re-release of the last of us part two, maybe with some tweaks and improved whatever. I mean, I know they already did some, some work on it, but I, I would fully expect that they do something like that to grab up some new sales, right? As, um, right as the season drops because there's going to be a lot of people that are looking to play the game after seeing the next season. Um, let's see. Do you think if more CEOs like this guy got hired, boycotts on bad games would be a lot more effective? If a lot more CEOs like this guy got hired, boycotts on bad games would be more effective. Um, like you think he's more sensitive to worse performance or something? Um, I don't. I don't think necessarily. Like the thing with boycott stuff is that I think. A lot of these executives don't directly, I don't think they directly tie like the, the boycotts concerns to the failure. Like, you know, if, if there's a game that releases with a crazy over monetized mess of a, of a game, I think you probably see the executives just going, oh, well, but they were just pissed off because we were trying to be more progressive with the story or something like, I, you know, I, I don't think that that's necessarily going to be a, a one for one, you know, assumption. Cause like, even now you're seeing with Warner brothers, they're looking at the performance of suicide squad. And it seems like they're concluding that a lot of its failures are tied up in this, like sweet baby ink protests. And so they're like, yeah, it's just uh sexist and racist gamers that don't want to support the game and are bashing it. So it's not that we made a bad game. It's that it's, it's that they're sexist. And I think that that's unfortunately how we end up getting so many games that are consistently bad from the same groups. Like they just cannot learn because they, <laughs> they just refuse to acknowledge what seems pretty clear is the case. Um, you know, it's just weird. Disco Cobra, Jesus, thank you for the 50, my friend. Stellar Blade looks Stellar Blade looks good. I need to play the demo. Only a handful of games I'm anticipating for the rest of the year. How about you? Possibly Ghost on PC, Hellblade 2, Black Myth Wukong, Stalker 2. Other than that, I don't see much to be excited for. Um, again, thank you for the 50. Very, very generous, my goodness. Um, as for what I am looking forward to, I mean, yeah, Ghost on PC would be awesome. Hellblade 2 is very intriguing to me. I don't really know what to make of that one, but that's one to keep an eye on. Um, Assassin's Creed Red, Star Wars Outlaws. I'm keeping an eye on that one too. Star Wars Outlaws, I think, has a lot of potential. Um, mm. Disco Cobra 2013 donated $50 through Super Chat. So I think that that's one. Black Myth Wukong is interesting. Um... I'm trying to think of any others. I don't know. There's, yeah, I don't know. There's, there's a lot. There's a lot of op or opportunities, and I think there's a lot. Robbie to keep donated on. two dollars. Do you think Halo and Gears of War is a dead franchise now? Do you think Halo and Gears of War are a dead franchise? Uh, I don't think they're dead. I think that there's a lot less interest in them than before, and I think that if they want to really be. I mean, Halo Infinite was pretty good. It just had some of the worst live service support of any live service game I've ever seen. Like it was set up to be so successful and they just blew it. Um, it's kind of like Diablo 4. You know, they had this great game. Everybody loved it. Great reviews. And then they just blew the seasonal 
support. So I think that Halo is in a good spot and just needs to release another solid game with a much better like live service support plan. As for um, Gears of War, I think there are some old school fans, but I think it's kind of in the same spot that God of War was pre-2018. I think it needs a reinvention um, and just a reframing because... I don't know if the new generation um, is familiar with it. So you got to find a way to like rewrap it and repitch it to people, which is, is doable. I'm not saying like, oh yeah, you have to make all of them like teenage girls and then do that. Like, I'm not saying that, um, but I think it needs to be reframed and repitched to gamers because I, I just think that it's been so long since we had a really good Gears of War, like a really, really good gears of war game um that they're gonna have to come up with some way to reframe it yeah stellar blade yeah we can touch on that real quick and i know somebody's gonna be like he said touch on that <laughs> um yeah the stellar blade demo so this is a game like i didn't I all honestly, like I wasn't looking too close at the original trailers they dropped didn't seem particularly compelling to me. It wasn't really hooking me, but, uh, I've seen clips of the demo and actual gameplay and stuff. And this is a game that actually looks like there's a lot more gameplay there than I initially thought. I mean, it was one of those things initially it was just being talked about because of big butts that cannot lie. But then we get actual gameplay footage and it's like, oh, there's actually like a game here, like a pretty good game from what we can tell. How many of you guys have played the, the, um, demo? Have you guys tried it? What are you saying? Let me, let me pull up your chat messages and I can look through those because to me, it seems from what I've seen, it seems like there's been a lot of really positive reception to it. Um, <laughs> big butts are definitely truthful. Um, yeah, we cannot deny. Sure can't. Sure can't. It's probably because this is combat game of the year. I played the demo. Looks way more deep than initially thought. I liked it a lot. Yeah, maybe I, I'll just download it. Maybe we do a video on it tomorrow. Dude, I love how AJ, IGN is raging about this game. That's how you know it's going to be good, even if it's not that good. You know, you mean? <laughs> yeah, it's well, again, like there's, it's another example of why I think like boycotts and things just don't work because people like to play things even if everybody else is freaking out about it. It's like, no, screw you. Especially when it's like, because it, it comes off as like prudish. If somebody's like, oh, how dare you play that game when they're wearing tight clothing? How dare you? It is unrealistic expectations for people, you know? It's like, what are you talking about? Yeah, it's the Streisand effect. And one of the things about the gaming community, which is really funny to me, is that a lot of the gaming community is like spiteful. Like people will pay money and play games out of spite, even if they're not super into it, just to say screw you to like sites like Kotaku or people that are trying to like virtue signal about how good of people they are that they're not playing this game, you know? <laughs> It's like, okay, screw you. I wasn't going to play Hogwarts Legacy, but now I am, you know. Um, yeah, it's it's a whole thing. Um, let's see. It's going to have a ton of mechanics. You can do a lot of super fun combos. It's going to have an interesting story. Winky face. Uh-oh, winky face. Have you touched on the IGN union strikes? No, I didn't hear about any of that. I didn't hear about any of that. That's crazy. Uh, my male brain says to play for one reason, and my gamer brain just isn't interested <laughs> IGN said the creator didn't see a woman ever in his or ever when his wife was a developer on the game. <laughs> Oops. Awkward. Um, it's like, what was that one game where like, I forget who it was. It was somebody at Kotaku, I think, but they were like, I can tell that not a single woman worked on this game. And then they show the, the team and it's like half women. And it's like, oh, well, <laughs> never mind. Oh man. I don't think it's gamers. I think people are just spiteful in general. Oh yeah, that's probably probably the case. IGN had some stupid takes about 
Yeah, I, I don't know. It's so weird that this, all this is coming to, to bear at the same time, but I really hope we're not about to deal with another like wave of Gamergate crap because it's just like, it's one big headache for everybody. Um, but we'll see. I mean, the more these groups double down on all of this, it's, it's just gonna, players are not gonna respond well to it. Is it the same guy that did the RE5 video? Oh, that would make sense if it was. We took the creek? Hell yeah, brother. I didn't see that. That's awesome. Oh, sorry. It was just IGN or IGN workers unionizing, not striking. Okay. Okay. Um, looks like how normal K-pop singers look like back, look like black, pink, and all that who are very beautiful people. Okay. IGN corporate let go of three people unceremoniously. And that caused some row. Okay. Yeah. I mean. I still, honestly, I don't know how these big companies like IGN are profitable. I genuinely don't understand it. Like the fact Kotaku's having financial problems. I'm like, you think? I don't know how they make money. Like ad revenue on sites is not very high at all. Their YouTube channels, they pump out a lot of videos, but it's not, I don't think it's enough to actually turn a profit. Like I'm just genuinely confused by it <laughs> i just don't know how they do it there's got to be some sort of like they, they it must be that they just get tons of money for like building guides for games and um maybe they get more sponsorships than i'm aware of for like op-eds and stuff i don't know It's just the pure volume that creates cash flows. Well, and that's why they're so interested in something like, you know, chat GPT written articles. And I don't know if IGN specifically is interested in it, but a lot of those gaming sites have started to double down and use those. Um, oh, Fallout 76 got an update. Oh. Okay, should we see this? I'll start downloading Stellar Blades demo on my on my PS5 here while we uh while we go through this. Uh PlayStation. PlayStation. Do they still do that in trailers? They should. PlayStation. Stellar Blade. Stellar Blade. Okay, where's the, is the demo? Demo, yeah, Stellar Blade demo. Select edition. Add to library. Download to console. Okay. Studio PS5, download to console. Vuya. there we go. It's going, gents, it's going. Um. Okay, who said Stellar Yams? <laughs> God damn it. <laughs> How dare you? How dare you? That's amazing. Okay. You win. You win the chat. You win the chat for the day. Congratulations. <laughs> okay. Um, let's do let's do this. Okay. Maddie, what's the deal, bro? Sorry. News and me. There we go. Uh, okay. The one, the only, the man, the myth, the legend, the Mace Windu hoodie wearing PlayStation 2 hat repping madman from, I think, New York, Mr. Matty Plays, the one and only, is reporting as of a few days ago on Fallout 76's new update that he's reviewing. I've heard nothing about this. And yet I'm intrigued. You know, I've said before that Bethesda Game Studios is sort of like a lol cow. And if you don't know what a lol cow is, it's basically a 
it's basically like an internet personality usually that is lacking in self-awareness to the point where it's entertaining, but not for the reasons they think. So like you, you think of like somebody that makes, um, music videos or something, and they're really bad at singing, but they don't realize they're really bad at singing, but everybody's still watching the videos because it's just so funny to watch this person who thinks they're really good at this thing fail at it. And I realized that BGS games for me are sort of a similar thing where I like looking at the dumpster fire. I enjoy and find it in a sort of morbidly curious way. I find it very entertaining. And it's the case with Starfield. It's the case with Fallout 76, where I'm just fascinated by the disaster and I just want to know more. Now, to be clear, I have tried Fallout 76 on many occasions. I've gone back to it after major updates. I've tried to do the narrative stuff. I've tried to play with the NPCs. I tried to play it before the NPCs were added. I tried to do all of this stuff. And I have just not, like, I've never been able to get hooked on it. It's just never worked for me. It's always left me kind of. Eh, I just, there's no dopamine that goes in. I'm like, honestly, I'd rather just play Fallout 4 again. I'd rather go play something else just because it, it doesn't do anything like well, you know? And I just don't have a friend group that finds the core mechanics and stuff of, of Fallout 76 particularly, um, compelling. Like I just, I just don't. So they've still been updating it. They've been doing some new stuff. And apparently this new update is fairly polarizing. The description on Maddie's video is if there's one positive to come from America's playground, it's that I have finally come to a particular realization. Fallout 76 is popular enough to be sustained, but it will never over deliver on expectations. Interesting. Is it popular enough to deliver? Or to be self-sustaining? I guess they're still making updates for it. Does anybody actually while while I'm while we go through this, can you guys click around and just try to see if you can find any player numbers or anything? Between the hat and the hoodie, I am dressed like it's 2005. And today we're talking about a game that certainly didn't launch from that year because when games are launching back then, they may have not been the best, but they were content complete. Today, we're talking about a live service game, my favorite, Fallout 76. We've talked about this game extensively on the channel. Now we really just dip in for every major new update. And I dip in every time with the hopes of loving this product because I adore Fallout. I have the Fallout bug. The new TV show is upon us soon on April 11th. All of the episodes are going to drop. I cannot wait, but this update isn't just any update and kudos to Bethesda for sticking with this game because anytime I feel 76 is on its last legs, I've made videos straight up saying I think the game is dead now and I've been completely wrong and Bethesda in 2023, I felt the commitment was starting to waver, but I had learned my lesson at that point. And in 2024, they have stormed back with some pretty massive content additions. Good for them. I think we all thought back in like 2018 when this launched after the reception it garnered, we were like, there's no way that this game gets long term support. Like, there's no way that this thing is still around in two, three years. But sure enough, it is. Brand 238 says 11,000 right now on Steam, average of 6,000 in March. Golly. So you're saying it averages six. I mean, that's. That's just on Steam, by the way. So it's also available for free on Game Pass, or rather included in your subscription. So it's probably at like, I don't know, maybe 20,000 right now. I mean, that's decent. That's pretty solid. That's not bad. Today's update, as I said, wasn't just any update. It's the America's Playground update. Finally introducing for the first time in the game's lifespan, a brand new open world explorable area to add on to Appalachia. So it's no longer just that base game map and expedition. Appalachia. You got to say it like you got, you got la uh, molasses pouring out of your mouth. Appalachia. That's how you got to do it where you go out and kill enemies, you could finally roam these areas, interact with NPCs, pick up quests, hopefully find some dungeons, all of that cool stuff, right? So walking away from this experience now, I can say for sure that I have had this 
spiritual awakening with 76 and realize that no matter what this game does, I don't think I'm going to be happy because it always feels like it's a half step away from where it needs to be. And in some ways, this update has really surprised me. The quality bar is definitely starting to raise for 76, although I know the standards for many are low. I know it's an easy target, but I think as someone who has played the game since its launch, really tried to hang with it, I feel like you can see the efforts there. But what I'm noticing is the game is big enough to sustain, but not enough to invest and try to push its growth. It very much knows its place. And so I have just come to that level of acceptance that 76 is not going to do any more than I hope it will. And I'll continue to circle around for those updates. But America's Playground taught me something really important. And it's not one of those typical, <laughs> Maddie, oh, the update's not quite there yet. No, it's more like there are good things here, but they just missed the mark slightly. And I'll explain why. So ladies and gentlemen, if you're new here, and you're into whatever's going on with Fallout, we're going to be talking a lot about it in April, that's for sure. Ladies and gentlemen, consider subscribing if you like all Fallout. Oh yeah, does the new season, or does the Fallout show launch in April? When does it launch? I don't know. Uh, yeah, go sub to Matty. Matty's uh, somebody I've done collabs with. He's one of the guys that kind of inspired me to get into video game content creation years and years and years ago. I used to watch him when he was like, I don't even know how old he was, but like when I was 15, 16 years old, like I'm literally living in my mom's basement. I used to watch his videos. So <clears throat> I think it's this month. He said April, there's a lot of content. I don't know. My brain's fried. Maybe he did say anyway. Um, well, I mean, we'll, we'll continue seeing what this update is. I, I just think Fallout 76 is in a weird spot because it does have a very committed fan base. I mean, let's be honest. If you're still playing Fallout 76, you're probably willing to put up with a lot, I would imagine. Yeah, I pulled it up on SteamDB. Fallout 76, 11,200 players. 24-hour peak was 12,000. And it's been at 11,000 player peak, roughly, since last week. So they did this update looks like Tuesday afternoon, Tuesday night. And then it spot or spiked up to 11,000 a week ago. And I mean, if you look at the graph, it's really not bad. I mean, it's right around 10,000, 12,000, 13,000, 15,000. Like it had a little dip in like late February, early March down to 9,000 for a week, but it's not bad for what it is. I mean, for a game that I thought probably was dead, it's got a, about 10,000 people on Steam that are regularly playing it. So, I mean, with 10,000 players, a lot of those guys are probably buying microtransactions. A lot of them might be subscribed to that Fallout First thing that's like 100 bucks a year. Like, they they probably are pretty committed. But the question with all this is whether there's growth. And that's the, where I think Maddie's getting at, where there's not a lot of growth with Fallout 76. I think most people have their minds made up on it. I've tried Fallout 76 many times. I think if I was going to get into it, I would have already gotten into it. And I think that's true of a lot of other people, especially now that it's on Game Pass and a lot of people can just try it um, without having to fork over any cash. So I don't think there's a lot of room for it to grow. They're just trying to keep the current player base happy and extract cash from them when they can. But there's not a lot of growth potential. Um, Unlike, you know, even something like Helldivers, I think there's growth potential. If there's a big announcement of like, yeah, now we're fighting on Super Earth and you can come back home and you're fighting through like actual neighborhoods and stuff. That I think will get a lot of people interested. Those clips will go viral once again on TikTok and YouTube shorts and stuff. And people are going to talk about it all over the place and uh, it'll be very, very successful. Um, Fallout 76, I just don't think there's that much potential, especially being as old as it is. Fallout content. So 76, I'm hoping with this video that you walk away with a lot more information than many provide on this game because I feel it's an easy one to kick while it's down, right? It had the Damn right, baby. Cheers. Horrendous launch. It barely crawls out of 2018 and 19 alive. In 2020, you get Wastelanders, and it felt like there it was a window. The masses had started to believe again. It felt like this was an answer to what Bethesda needed to do for 76 in the first place, which was make an online PvE game effectively. And each update since then has added to that. They've focused more and more on PvE content, more and more on questing. And so here with America's Playground, we finally get our first open world area, something I've been asking for since 
the game really first came out. It seemed like such an obvious thing to do. Now, before this, we last talked about 76 in December yeah. and how they introduced new expeditions to the game and how they introduced new expeditions to the game. And <laughs> a little double take. We've all been there. So it's an easy editing oopsie to make. Oh, wait, I muted it accidentally. Sorry. And how they introduced new expeditions to the game. And these, for those who have never played 76, are gigantic raids, effectively. They're shooting galleries. And this was definitely the prettiest one that 76 had produced. You can say what you will about this game, but I... But even that, like, this is this is why I haven't been able to play Fallout 76. Look at look at the footage that's on screen of the bullet. Galleries. Okay? And this was definitely the... So, like, watch when the bullet hits versus when the damage is actually calculated and when they, they die. So, fired, hit. One... So you see like it's instantaneous. The bullet hasn't traveled yet, but it's already registered damage. Now it hits it. And so then that's uh another oh, the the shell just appears. There it goes. It's flying out. And then we fire again. Where did that next wave of damage come from? Okay. But the bullet comes again. So fire Bullet traveling this time, I guess it misses. And then another bullet's fired. Okay, wait for it. And then fire. Bullet registers damage, but it hasn't actually traveled from the gun. It's still right here. It hasn't traveled to the model yet, but damage has been calculated. And then the bullet travels and then makes contact. There's the bullet or the, the blood spray and then the character dies. So when you're actually playing it, it just feels like the whole thing is super delayed because the damage is calculated at a different time from when the bullet actually makes content or contact. And so it drives you crazy. And for me, like Fallout 4 doesn't have that problem. Uh, even Starfield doesn't have that problem. It's just a Fallout 76 thing from them trying to rework the, the creation engine Frankenstein mess into uh, an online engine. And it just doesn't work that well. Shooting galleries. It's like, now that I pointed it out, watch the delay in real time of it happening. This was definitely the prettiest one that 76 had produced. You can say what you will about this game, but I will. Because you shoot, the health bar drops, and then there's a slight, like, tenth of a second, fifth of a second, and then she falls back. It's just ever so slightly delayed, but when you're playing it, your monkey brain can pick up on those little bitty things and it makes the whole game feel really sluggish. It's really frustrating. Always defend its art direction. Anytime I fire this game up, I am pulled into that world. And certainly when it comes to Atlantic City and its music and its appearance, the neon signs, everything about it, the noir feel, like they really nailed it. So being able to explore that initially was awesome. The quest starts off with you going to one of the many train stations, reading about this little show that's going on at this opening bar. So you head over to the bar, you have probably one of the most hilarious openings to a Fallout quest I have seen. <laughs> I can't listen to this baloney no more. Let's light this place up. God damn it. Everyone shut <laughs> Like this dude just okay. had it. He, he That's a little funny. <laughs> That's the Emil Pagliarulo special. He's like, how do we start this quest out? Let's create it in a really compelling way. I know he didn't work on this. It's BGS Austin, but still it's funny to just think of like somebody trying to do something really serious and that's the product i i obviously they were trying to be funny but still it's funny to think of that as like a really serious intro to a story was not feeling the music here and so i authentically laughed at that for a couple minutes i thought that was some great stuff there and from there you learn that one of the russos is hooked on the devil's blood this is a brand new chem that was introduced in atlantic city uh -oh. the only way to get off is to get some in your system and so you head out to atlantic city you're dropped into the casino district, which is one of multiple areas that you can explore in this game. And I did expect them to reuse the maps they had built for expeditions, but the problem really is in how they've structured the content. Again, one thing I'll always defend with 76 is its exploration. I would even go to the length of saying 76 is exploration 
is better than Starfields. I really do think they have something here in 76 where the wandering is good, the point A to point B is good, as you would in a Bethesda Game Studios game. You see something in the distance that looks unique and interesting, and you go ahead and visit it, check it out, and you're like, oh man, thank God I explored that. And 76 has a lot of those moments, so to bring that to a new location was very exciting because it reminded me of Fallout 3 and its DLC, New Vegas and its DLC, and the potential those brought to the table. And, and I would agree. I think it's better than Starfield's exploration. That's not saying much because Starfield's exploration was bafflingly bad. Uh, baffling in the sense that BGS was always good at, like Maddie said, the wandering exploration where they just leave it open-ended. Yeah, go get lost. Look for different things to pull your attention, to distract you, and just get lost. Wander about. And then Starfield, they're like, okay, that thing that we're really good at? Okay, let's not do that at all. <laughs> let's let's instead put them in fishbowls where they can see three things that are interesting and then wander for multiple minutes on foot to get to those. And then we'll, we'll call it good. And then they have to fast travel and load to a different section. So I agree. I think Fallout 76's exploration is better than Starfield's. But again, that's not saying much. Here in Atlantic City, I already knew the art direction is going to be great. So it was just about adding locations to explore. So there's no new map markers. You don't have these new moments of discovery. Is there a city map? Maybe. There's not even a isolated map for this area, which was already a little concerning when I opened it up because I thought, well, isn't the point to go and see new dungeons and interact with new people and track new quests? So you do have this main quest to track. There are a few side quests also that you can track. But when I went into this one area that was a bar that hosts the family, that's where I started to have that awakening of, man, 76 is always just a half step away. You walk into this, what I would say is a beautiful bar, fully populated. You can hear all the chatter around. It's very full of life. Again, th that noir feel is captured excellently here, as it has been throughout all of Atlantic City. But it's just a bunch of nameless NPCs. There's no interaction. I go and talk to one interesting named individual at the top of the bar. And I get to ask him a few questions about the family. And that's nice and all. But there's no quest pickups. There's no interesting moment here. And you realize, oh, this is just a host probably for later main story content. Okay, got it. So you leave, you go on your merry way, and all of these maps that you've already played through, thanks to the expeditions, are connected through sewer grates. So yeah, you click on one, and it zips you to the other, and it's as jarring as it sounds. I, 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 You can tell this was maybe not a part of the original plan. They thought, well, hey, we can reuse these. And the reason this is a little disappointing is because, yes, it's cool on premise. Like, it worked in Starfield. We'll just do big load screens between. Oh, man. But what it says to me is that my initial gut feeling about 76 and how they were handling the content rollout here was correct, which was when they told us, oh, we have these expeditions and then we're going to give you America's Playground later because we have so much to give you. I thought to myself, I don't know about that because right now 76 needs an abundance of content. If you have it, you should probably give it. And since they were expanding the base game map where I imagine most of their resources were going there, I felt that this update was going to potentially feel more like this sort of shot in the arm like hey it's something right and it's a it's exactly that right like even though you can roam not knowing where you're roaming to no map markers or anything like that very few quests and interesting npcs to interact with it feels hollow unfortunately and it has like the life there but no one of intrigue to really interact with now the main quest itself mm. is entertaining you head to this show you dress up as a clown you can have a choice here whether or not you want to kill someone to send a message and it changes your quest ending you fight off in my case a bunch of clowns because i chose to kill this guy instead of teaching him a lesson in another way overall the questing in 76 has become much better not just from an enjoyment at least unique, yeah. sense but also like even voice acting i thought that it was well performed whereas that was something i was critical of with expeditions and here in 76's update for America's Playground, I thought they actually did a better job making these characters feel lifelike. So much so that the voice performances were starting to shine a stronger light on how dated the engine is and how, wow, they really need to have some updated facial animations for these characters that are much more expressive, which is something I typically don't say about Bethesda. Man, it does look like Fallout New Vegas levels. Like, bro. I get it's an online game, but damn, look at this guy, especially that are much more After expressive, this. which is yeah. something I typically don't say about Bethesda Game Studios games. So I think that is saying something about the wow. vocal performance here. 
yeah, the, the questing is great, but it's like if you're going to bring in this new open world zone, you've got to fill it with life. you got to make these NPCs more interactable. You have to feed more quests into them, produce new allies that you can bring back to your camp. The loot here is pretty cool. They have a lot of that figured out since the Nuka World on Tour update, which I was very complimentary of. But as you can see here, little things here and there, like overall the enjoyment, yeah, it was had. Like I, I didn't hate my time here, but I definitely walked away with this almost spiritual awakening, if you will, of going, man, this game just may never satisfy me. And I know what you're thinking. You've probably rolled your eyes or scoffed at your phone or whatever you're listening to this on and go, oh my God, you're just realizing this now, dude. But here's the thing, right? I don't think it's a surprise to anybody that I love Fallout. I'm a gigantic fan of the franchise, and 76 is kind of the bane of my existence at certain times with how it's treated, why it's operating, and the conclusion I came to is this. Fallout 76 is... What a hideous carpet. Oh, and my God. The conclusion God. I came to is this. I'm sorry, Matt. I am listening, but Jesus... And then look at the textures on the walls of this like wood paneling, but it's not like the proper. It's like they didn't even go to the trouble of properly ending it. The texture just cuts off there instead of having the box actually close off like it would if this was an actual like. Oh, man, oh, oh, it's so gross. <laughs> I understand maybe they were trying to go for a decoration, but why is the carpet glowing? It looks like it's glowing what yeah like this they, they need a seizure warning for this man Fallout 76 is making enough money and having a big enough player base to sustain itself <laughs> kubrick has been beaten for the creepiest carpet ever jesus yeah oh wow with updates well there's moments where you're like oh we can defend the art direction in Fallout 76 but then you see stuff like this and it's like what what money and having a big enough player base to sustain itself with updates like America's Playground. But it is not big enough and growing enough to push the envelope a little bit and do something big and exciting and over deliver. You always get either exactly what you expected with 76 or in my case, typically a little bit less. And experiencing that over and over and over in these two, three, four hour pockets as I keep re-downloading the game, hoping this update is the moment I can sit in a video and go, Fallout 76 is fantastic. This is the direction. Keep going, Bethesda. But I have to accept that there's a player base that loves this and thinks this is awesome. And that is not me, clearly. But also that even with these updates that should speak to my sensibilities, it's not capturing the feel of what I love about Fallout. And I just have to accept that that's it. I gotta go back to New Vegas three, four, like I've been doing a quiet side New Vegas replay as I'm progressing towards this television show relaunch because I wanna do some content around New Vegas. And maybe I got a bit of that old school Bethesda bug in me, but even looking at Fallout one and two where we're trying to do some content around that, I'm just, I'm just thinking about these games in all these different ways. And one of my favorite things about the Fallout franchise is how each entry does something a little bit different. But then I get to 76 and I realize it's just not hitting anywhere specific on the board. And it's upsetting because I feel, again, this update is exactly what I was asking for. But the fact that exploration, which is the one thing I've always defended 76 on and said, like, hey, this map ain't bad. Like, that's not the problem here. This sense of exploration is better than what Starfield brought to the table. Like, they got something here. The fact that when you bring us to a new location, it almost feels as if that's an afterthought to the point where we couldn't even get a little localized map for these new locations just says to me that this is more of a stopgap piece of content. And the only reason I would say it worries me a bit is we did have that leak for Fallout 76, which showed old Fallout 3 content, like DuPont Circle, I think it was. They had that in 76 and my fear is that they're going to channel a little bit of fallout 3 energy in 76 and you can't do fallout 3 which to me is like the pinnacle of video game exploration next to skyrim you can't i mean the pinnacle of video game exploration i, I mean i guess for the time fall 3 was very compelling 
Uh, Skyrim, I think, was something else. I mean, Skyrim it was a phenomenon. But I, I mean, I think you got to say like Red Dead 2, probably Breath of the Wild is up there because when Breath of the Wild dropped, it was just a totally different way of doing things. Um, but I, I don't know if Fallout 3 was ever considered to be like quite on that level. Like it was very, very good for the time, but um, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I do think they're probably going to tap into Fallout 3 and try to bring some stuff over from that and do it as like a, a little spinoff thing. Cause it just makes sense. It's easy, easy marketing, right? Get yeah, people to try it in a half measured way and be like, Oh yeah, look, there's, this is the place that you did an expedition in, except now you can roam with it. And there are NPCs here and there, except nothing's really happening. You're just kind of following your waypoints for your quest. That is just as bad in my opinion as what the problem was for many fans with expeditions, which is they thought these were going to be zones you go to like the pit and you get to explore and do a couple of quests and I just feel like now you have this weird in-between moment. It's like you got to do either expeditions or the open world zone. My suggestion for anyone from the 76 or Bethesda team who ends up watching this video is I would say pick the open world lane and add expeditions to that. But I would say bringing us to new zones with PvE content, if you care about like the true Fallout player who is interested in that content, then you probably want to focus open world, focus on exploration, focus on loot, and then add the expeditions on top. I think because I was introduced to this zone through expeditions and then went back again here to do quests in the same zone, except this time there was like no exploration, it felt a little sour, where I think maybe if it was introduced in reverse, and obviously this is where game development's complicated because maybe one part of the project was ready before the other, but I feel like if these roles were reversed, I may have had an entirely different take here. And that's the key with live service. It's about timing, it's about content introduction, it's about how you present things and what you're doing within these new things you are presenting. And I feel like either if you did a whole combined update, where it was like, hey, we have this new main quest and we have the expeditions, come check it out. Or if you did the open world first and then the expeditions, I feel like it would have softened the blow or in the case of combining it all, I think you would have just had a real winner here because- I mean, I, the order does matter. I, I would agree with that, but it's, it's also just a matter of pure content. Like the description of this little casino space or bar space that he's in right now meeting with this guy. He said it felt empty, it felt lifeless. Well, it felt lively, but you couldn't talk to anybody OG that wasn't named, you know? Is now a member. Um, hey Luke, hope you're doing well. Thanks for the wealth of content to keep me entertained while working night shifts. Keep up the awesome work. Well, thank you, my friend. Thank you for the one month, first of all. And uh, yeah, happy to have you. Thank you for watching, my friend. Thank you. Thank you. Um, but yeah, I mean, like this, this bar is always going to feel uninteresting that he was describing earlier. Like you walk in, there's lots of people walking around, but it doesn't really feel alive because you can't talk to anybody. There's no interaction. There's no discussions or anything. So like, that's always going to feel that way. It just will like whether this is introduced second or, or first, that's just going to be the consistent problem. Um, so to a certain extent, I don't think the order really will change the content issues. Other things like, the fact that the quality of texture work, the quality of um, the level design and things seems to be dropping at the same time they're growing more ambitious is just concerning and it's not a great sign. Um, but I mean, then again, they have 11,000 players right now. I mean, I just refreshed it. They are at 11,030 right now. Which is pretty good when you consider the all-time peak for this game four years ago uh, on Steam was 32,000 on May 16th of 2020. So they are at a third of their all-time peak four years after the fact. And that's pretty good. That's pretty damn good for a live service game. So the people that are playing this are very resistant to quality dips. They're very resistant to... <laughs> Um, 
well, pretty much anything that would normally scare somebody away. So <laughs> I think that that's, that says a lot. Uh, and they, they might be relying on that a bit. You know, that might be a part, like part of the consideration. It's just like, yeah, we don't really need to put that extra effort into it. We don't need to pour that much extra energy into it because the fans don't really care that much, you know? Uh, 76 players are really a different breed. They scare me. I mean, they know what they like, and I mean, they're willing to put up with a lot. So, more power to them. I would have left a long time ago, but they're still playing it. I don't understand it, but they're doing it. I don't get it, but they're doing it. Um, How's the candle doing? Oh, great. Todd burns with us forever. May Todd be with you and also with you. That's what you're supposed to, uh, supposed to do. Um, oh my God. This game is described as a dust like game where you play as a duck. This was not on my bucket list for today. I did, I did not expect this to be announced today. Like, it's funny because the duck mechanic actually does seem to add some interesting variability to it. With flight and everything. Um, like, it looks clunky as hell, but... Yeah, it's just straight up rust. It's straight up rust. That's, uh, I, I <laughs> again, this was not on my bucket list. I had no idea that was going to be a thing. That's, uh, that's wild. Um, I can't tell if this is another April Fool's joke. I don't know. It would be really funny if it was, if it was, let's see. Uh, duck side is... I mean, they announced it. Maybe it is a, an April Fool's joke. I still think it might it might find some inordinate success. Actually, <laughs> I think people would actually play it. Um, that's funny. That's funny. The other animal themed game that that also kind of came out of nowhere two weeks ago. This one was shown off at the kind of funny spring showcase. Was Squirrel with a Gun? When interacting with squirrels. As they are known to carry diseases, and in some cases, large firearms. The squirrel is known for its deadly aim and non-compliance with basic gun safety regulations. So it is advised to steer clear of an area with any reports of a squirrel with a gun. Selecting its weapons carefully the squirrel adapts its strategy to the ever-changing environment. The squirrel navigates its surroundings with unmatched agility. Join this journey into the hidden world of the common squirrel. Fall 2024. I think like this is one of those things where it's just... A game built on a gimmick. Like, that's all it is. But that's okay. That's okay. You know? If a gimmick is fun, and if the game is priced correctly for, like, five, ten bucks, that's okay. That's all you really need. Um, 
<laughs> like if it's five, 10 bucks, cool. It's when like you have a gimmick game, but it's priced at like a hundred dollars or 70 bucks that you run into trouble. Um, <laughs> I've been following this game for like two years. Oh dude, it's close. It's close. IGN says no duck side is not an April Fool's joke. It's funny that they had to clarify that. Have you seen Angry Joe's video on the Jonkler? He actually seemed quite upset. Uh, and also, what's the player count looking like now? Um, when I pulled it up earlier, it was at like. Can I go back? I can. Uh, eleven. Yeah, eleven hundred. So it's one thousand one hundred and seven. So it spiked on Thursday at 3,000. Next day, it peaked at 2,100. The next day, it peaked at 1,700. The next day, at 1,500. And today, it's peaked at about 1,100. So it seems just like as people have finished the grind for Joker, they're just moving on. They're just giving up on it. And, I mean, already, people are... The, the subreddit has just given up on it. I mean... There's, there's no doubt people are just done with it. Um, yeah, I mean, people are just, <laughs> am I effing Joker broke? <laughs> oh man. Yeah, Harley has history with Arkham Joker, so getting past her initial gut reaction to our Joker and accepting him for who he really is is going to be hard for her from Rocksteady. Is that supposed to happen in episode two? It seemed like she took an acceptance to him immediately and with lax humor. Yeah, no, they just don't have content for it. I think they probably have, like, more backstory they've written for him, but there's no, like... They, they just didn't show it to the players. It's really weird. Um... Yeah, people, I've defended this game for too long. Yeah. Yeah, one of the longest sentences I've seen. My Okay, let's read it as one sentence. At the start of this game, it was very enjoyable and fun, but since this season, they've added hardly anything, and the amount of spam you get by the aliens or whatever they're called, it, that is ridiculous. There's about 100 snipers aimed at you at once whilst you're trying to destroy crystals so you can stop regenerating and get massive destroyers spamming on you whilst getting sniped and sprayed. This game has gone very downhill. I could suggest that they could tone down the amount of enemies aimed at you at once instead of having 150 or 50 enemies on you all at once. Sorry if none of this makes sense. Well put. <laughs> just, okay. <laughs> cool. Love it. Oh, dude, I'm kind of interested in this now. Hold on. This just popped back up on my on my recommended feed. Um, this is funny. So four months ago, I did this video like reaction thing to this Dice, or not Dice, this Wired interview that Todd Howard did where he went, went down and broke down his whole career as a game designer and game developer. But this was pre-Starfield initially. Um, no, it would have been... When did Starfield launch? Hold on. No, Starfield launched in September. So it's after. So never mind. Never mind. I was like, maybe we watch this after this, but I guess we would have if it was just four months ago. This is an all-new experience. The most ambitious game that we've made and the scale of it dwarfs everything that we had done so far. For a long time, we wanted to do a space game, something that, that I've wanted to do for a long time, and something new outside of Fallout and Elder Scrolls, an IP that hasn't existed. So, we I've always been curious how much of like the, uh, the discourse these guys keep up with, you know? Like, how many do they, like, go through? He, he previously described that he went and, like, would read the subreddits and try to keep touch on um, some of that stuff just to 
kind of get a vibe of like where players were at, what they were enjoying, what they weren't enjoying. I doubt they do that anymore. Cause like if they did, I think they would make different decisions. You know, there, there are some interesting choices they've made that I don't think they would make if they were more in tune with the community. Uh, okay. What is this? I don't know what that is. Okay. Um, be just in the same spot as Bioware. I don't think quite as bad. Bioware straight up, if Dragon Age Dreadwolf is not overwhelmingly successful, I think they just get canned. Like, I, I don't know how they allow them to stay open. I just, I, I genuinely don't know how you could justify it. So I think they probably get shut down. Whereas BGS, I think if they have another game on the same scale or level of success as Starfield, I think it's still just like, oh, well, that was kind of disappointing. And then they'll just work on the next one. Like, I, I just don't think that it's quite the same. Bioware is in a much, much tougher spot. Um, bah, 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 bah. spoiler alert, Dragon Age won't be good still. I mean, I was talking to my wife, Nikki, about this because she really loves Dragon Age, um, like really loves Dragon Age. And so she was like, is it really going to be bad? Do you think it's going to be really be bad? And like, here's the deal with Dragon Age, Dreadwolf. There are not many. I, I can't think of a single instance, but. There's not many instances I can point to where a studio has had back-to-back -back colossal failures. And then they just casually drop like a 9 or a 10 out of 10. Typically, past performance is a decent indicator of future performance. And, and so, like, I just... I, I can't... I can't really imagine an instance or, or a, a realm where they are able to blow us away with Dreadwolf. I think it probably launches best case scenario. It's like an eight out of 10. It's like good, but not great or amazing or masterpiece or anything. It's just good. And like, that's the best case scenario. And for them, I think that would be a real triumph because that would be the first decently reviewed game they've made in over a decade. But I just don't see it going any other way. Like, I, I don't know how else it would go. Because any other situation um, would be kind of another colossal failure. But they're fighting like an uphill battle again. Where they are dealing with the expectations of Baldur's Gate 3. That's the really tricky thing that it's easy to forget about. Like, they're not... It's not like they're releasing this two, three years ago with lower expectations. They're releasing this after one of the most impressive fantasy role-playing games of all time released. And so now they're going to be graded against that. Um, and so, like, that's going to be a tough, tough uphill battle, you know. Yeah, it depends on how you define it. If you say, like, 8 is good, 9 is good you know, great or amazing, and then 10 is a masterpiece, then you put it at one spot. If you say that seven is good, eight is great, and then you have nine is amazing, but amazing isn't quite masterpiece, so masterpiece is 10, then yeah, you scale it differently. It just depends on how you define it. Um, which is why it's important to clearly state how you define those things. Because for some people, they might, like I, there was that one guy in chat the other day who was like, oh no, I think it should be leveled out where five or six is like average, because it's in the middle. Aww. Um, and so, like, you uh, you give games a five or a six if they're just fine. And then anything above that is great. I'm like, you got to be clear about that. Because if you were to come in and be like, oh, this game is okay. Five out of ten. <laughs> then you're going to run into some some big trouble if, if you're not clear about that, you know. 
when people are like, oh, what? You said the game was pretty good or it was okay. And you gave it a five? Are you insane? And it's because most people don't review that way. Um, bum, 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 bum. Now that you ask it, I genuinely can't think of a case. Any real bad game usually is a sign of a studio beginning to fail. Yeah, I, I've tried to think of it. And I, I mean, honestly, it's because usually there are not studios that have two back-to-back -back colossal flops that get to make a third game. Typically, after two back-to-back -back flops, they shut the studio down. So the fact that Bioware exists today is still amazing. Um, but I, I can't think of another instance of a studio, even that, like, what's an instance of a studio that had a colossal flop and then came out and did, like, a really well-received game? I mean, I guess you could say that Bethesda had Fallout 76, which was one of the worst-reviewed games of all time, and then, on the AAA scale especially, and then they came out with Starfield that reviewed pretty well like it was it was like 70 like high 70s low 80s so there's that yeah i guess you could say cdpr they launched cyberpunk in a disastrous state and then they came back and you could say like the the 2.0 update or phantom liberty was kind of a relaunch of the game so i guess you could say that so i think there are instances i guess that you could point to of like big flop and then they come out and they do like a pretty good job after that but two back-to-back -back flops, I can't think of another instance where somebody did that. You know? Uh, da Vinci, what's a game I feel more excited than I should be for as someone that tries not to get hyped because stay skeptical about stuff? Um, I mean, like, I'm really excited for GTA 6. I feel more, more justified in feeling really excited about GTA 6 just because it's Rockstar. And outside of like multiplayer modes, they tend to do a very, very good job. But again, like they, they, there's the potential that they could screw it up too. So who knows? But that's what I'm really excited about. Star Wars Outlaws I'm very interested in because the demo that they showed or the gameplay they showed was really, really impressive. They just have to do that. If they can do that, we're set. But we'll see because it's Ubisoft. Um Beyond that, I mean, Judas is interesting. I don't know if I'm excited for Judas yet, just because I still am not really sure what that even is supposed to be. Like, I, I feel like I've watched hours of explanations and interviews with Ken Levine, and I still am not really sure how this is different from just a game where you can, where there's like three main characters that you can choose to side with and go through the campaign with. And then there's some fun, like in unique dialogue and stuff that'll pop up depending on which one you side with on that run. Like I know there's other stuff they're doing cause they've described it. They've described how like you're expected to um, like, there will be different things that happen where this character will pop out and like close the door for you here instead of going over there and closing the door or not doing it at all. And so there's going to be different things that happen. So I know there's other stuff, but because they don't want to spoil anything, they, they just don't know what to say or not say, cause they don't want to spoil it for anybody, you know? I want to play Star Wars Outlaws only if it's decently received and on Steam. Uh, I mean, yeah, I would also say if it's decently received. it's We're going to get a feeling real quick. I think once they do any, like, any play tests, any demos, any extended gameplay trailers, I think that there will be a, a real... Kevin is now a member. Do you have a game where like we'll you know didn't like it at the start, but when you came back to it, you loved it? Mine's The Witcher 3. Oh, yeah. I mean, easy clap for me is uh, is Ghost of Tsushima. I really didn't like Ghost of Tsushima at first. And then when I traded on PS5 at 60 frames, loved it. Devoured it. So that would be mine. And thank you for nine months. My goodness. So, yeah, that that's the one that jumps out to me. Did not really connect with it at first. I was like, I can see how this is a really good game. I just, I'm not 
it's not hooking me. I'm not feeling like I want to play more. But I guess maybe the right word for Judas is mildly excited. For me, it's just intrigued. I'm very intrigued by it, but I want to know more. Because as of right now, everything that has been described to me is just confusing. And I understand it's a tough game to explain to people. And it's one of those games where the more you explain it, potentially the less fun surprises there are. So I get that, but still. Um... Have you replayed Sushima since your change of heart? Oh, well, once I had the once I tried it on PS5 and played it at 60, I immediately got hooked. I loved it. So I played the whole thing through, played the DLC, you know, um Iki Island and everything and I love it. Might play it again on on PC, I don't know. Still play demo thoughts? I haven't played it yet. I'll play it this afternoon. I have it downloading. Um Baldur's Gate 2 was my game. I didn't like it at first, but then I fell in love with it later. Oh, interesting. Do you think it needs a sequel or not? Oh, uh, Ghost of Tsushima? I don't think it needs one. I would love one, and I think we're going to get one. Oh yay, my my suit for my uh buddy's wedding is ready. We were nervous cuz they were like, "Oh yeah, we'll try to get it. We'll try to get it in time." You should have a few days extra clearance. I'm like, "That's cutting it kind of close." But they got it to us like weeks ahead of time, so that's good. Um Did you see the documentary that the Jinx is getting a follow-up? Or the documentary, The Jinx, is getting a follow-up. I did not see that. What would it be on? Because that's an amazing documentary. Um, does it just cover the trial, I guess? In case you don't know, The, the Jinx is a, a crazy documentary. I mean, it, it is wild. But it's this documentary on this guy, Robert Durst. And if you've never watched it, you absolutely sh should, because it's wild. Like this guy was the son of an extremely prominent guy in New York that owned, you know, the, it's the Durst family. They owned all sorts of buildings, millions and millions and millions of dollars worth of real estate, hugely powerful and wealthy individual, but he was highly, highly eccentric. And they tied him, like his wife disappeared. Yeah, she disappeared. Um, back in like the eighties, I think it was, and there was no trace of her. It was really, really suspicious. She just disappeared one day. It was really odd. And, uh, they never found her, never found a body. She just disappeared. And then he had like another close friend of his dis or uh, stop responding to phone calls. They found her dead in her LA apartment or LA house. Um, and so like they timed all the, all of this stuff, but more impressive than anything, uh, or more confounding than anything is that he also openly admitted to going on the run in, I think Galveston, Texas or somewhere like that. And he, uh, killed his neighbor. He was living in a, a crappy, like little apartment. And, uh, even though he's stupid wealthy, he was dressing up as an old woman, an old mute woman. And then he lived in this tiny little apartment sharing a house with this other guy, uh, Morris something. And he openly admitted to killing this neighbor. He said it was in self-defense. And then uh, chopping up his body and throwing it into the river. He like openly admitted to doing this. And because it was Texas and he was able to demonstrate that they couldn't prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he didn't do it in self-defense. He just responded negatively and he chopped up the body because he panicked. He was let go. He admitted to killing and chopping up a dude and was let go and found not guilty. It's crazy.
If you have good lawyers, it's amazing what you can get away with. So he got off of that, ran off, and uh, then later, years later, there was a documentary made that was eventually to be known as The Jinx, which is this documentary that we're, we're referencing here. And it was made by this guy, a filmmaker, and he goes through and he does these interviews with Robert Durst. And he frames it as like, I want to tell your side of the story. I want to tell your story about your wife that went dis and disappeared. I want to show that you're not this monster. I want you to be able to tell your story. And he ate it up because he's a narcissist. And he was like, oh, yeah, let's tell, them my, tell my story. Let's do it. And so they go through all of this. It's baffling. It's crazy. They do all these interviews. They find a letter that ties him directly to the murder of his uh, close friend that was unsolved. And uh, basically a letter had been sent to the police department describing that there was a body in this house. So oh, the murderer, without a doubt, sent that letter to the police department to tell them there was a body there so that she wouldn't decompose fully. And it was a, a last sign of like goodwill that he was going to let her body dis be discovered quickly. Um, and they tracked it down and found that it was written almost certainly by his hand with his handwriting misspelled in the same way he always misspelled Beverly Hills. Um, so like tying him directly to the murder of his close friend. And they reveal all this during this interview um, that's really awkward and tense and everything that you see here. And then he gets up. Let me see if I can find the original clip. Because this is crazy. This is crazy. Okay. Or well, maybe this is... Just take this in. Take this in. This is crazy. This is the bathroom. Yeah, that's... The You're right. This is the bathroom. Yeah. So they had just finished the interview after a very tense confrontation basically accusing him of killing his wife and his close friend. And he goes to the bathroom and his mic is still on. There it is. You're caught. You're right, of course. But you can't imagine. Talking to himself. Oh, this. Wait for it. Like rehearsing what he wants to say when he goes back out. So they caught him on recording saying, I killed them all, of course. So they went and uh, they submitted all of this evidence to the prosecutors. And then it was like they had the last couple of pieces they needed to tie it all together. And it led to him being... Uh, charged with the murders and being convicted of the murders. And so he uh, he ended his life being convicted as a murderer um, because he, like, without a doubt, I mean, beyond a reasonable doubt, he did it. And he was convicted of it as a result. Um, he did die of actually COVID in January of 2022. 
in a hospital outside the California prison where he was serving his life sentence. I mean, you can see how sickly he he looked at the t uh, towards the end. But um, apparently, they're doing a part two to the documentary. They are the five words everyone is talking about. Kill them all, of course. Robert Durst admitting to quote killing them all. Kill, kill them, them all, all, of course. When the jinx came out, I said, oh my God, this is going to be the biggest thing to hit my office since OJ. I am told directly you're planning on doing a sequel. The trial's gonna be a zoo. I will take care of anything you need taken care of. I don't like being threatened by you. I'm going to play you an audio recording that we found. This changed my perception of something I've been working on for 17 years. This is all confidential, right? This is confidential. Yeah, sure. My, my phone may be tapped at this point, but I'm going to tell you the story, okay? There's going to be surprises and surprises. I'm in for it. This sounds amazing. So it's one of the most crazy, insane cases that you might not have heard of because it's not like super, um, it's not super eye catching initially if you're outside of like the East Coast. But the Durst family is huge. They are ridiculously wealthy. They owned, I believe, the uh, leasing rights for the Freedom Tower, the building that replaced the um the world trade center like a stupid powerful and wealthy family and he's like a a convicted i think technically he sh he probably counts as a serial killer because i think it's the standard is three kills months apart and he fits that description so like it's crazy it's crazy so uh, fascinating documentary series. I highly recommend you watch it because it'll just blow your mind. Like this guy was out and about for how long? How long? And everybody was like, oh, well, he's just eccentric like that. Whatever. Whatever. Oh, uh, it looks like the trailer was, uh, the trailer was copyrighted. Oops. Oops. So if the stream randomly cuts out, that's why, because we're getting shut down. <laughs> <laughs> for for daring to watch the trailer. Sorry, everybody. Um, does he have kids? No, because he did an interview where he said he grew up in a pretty abusive childhood. Like he he told a story that was heartbreaking um, of when he was little. He was like five, six, or seven years old, and his uh, it was late at night, and his dad got him up from bed and brought him out to the hallway of their super fancy high-rise apartment mansion whatever it was and he has his son his young son look out the window onto the roof and he said he remembered seeing mommy out on the roof and he said i was confused why mommy would be on the roof i was confused because it didn't make sense why mommy would be on the roof well, she was standing on the roof and his father made him watch as his mother leapt from the roof. Like what kind of cruel, vindictive, nasty human being would do that? It's unbelievable. So he clearly had like a, a horrific, traumatizing backstory. Um... And so he didn't want kids because he was afraid he was going to do similar things to them. But it was it was insane. Like, it was crazy. So, but that documentary is fascinating if, if you ever are interested in true crime stuff. It's it's a wild ride. It's wild. Um, and it's, it's not one of those, like, um, making a murderer that's, like, really, or, or like, um, the... Uh, 
Paradise Lost films, it's not one of those where like they leave out a ton of information. Where like Paradise Lost, those documentaries, they just casually forget to mention like seven confessions that happened that had unique identifying information that ties the people charged to the crime in a way that they can't explain. They just forgot to mention that. And same with like making a murderer. They just don't mention a bunch of stuff that makes it like really hard to find a way <laughs> out of concluding that this one guy is responsible. So it, it's just a very fact-based thing and it had an actual consequence. I mean, it led to him being charged and convicted and, um, not many of these types of documentaries end up like that. Um, okay, let's wrap up with this. Let's wrap up with this, okay? Eat the poor. <laughs> yeah, why isn't that a why isn't that a trend? Um, okay. So uh this is a story from Video Games Chronicle, and I thought it was interesting. Phil Spencer, long cast as Xbox's savior, may be remembered as the man who killed it. Mmm. Interesting. Hit points. Now that all his big bets have failed, Spencer is turning to corrective measures. Um, this is interesting. I mean, basically, uh, it goes through some information. Um, when he spoke to at GDC last week, offering some context and spin on Microsoft's recent maneuvers while dropping a few now customary hints about Xbox's division's future plans. It's interesting. Like, Xbox has always been fighting a bit of an uphill battle. Not always, but since like the PS4 gen, they've really struggled. And most of their current problems go back to the Xbox One announcement. I mean, that's where all of this started to really crumble. Because at a pivotal point where people could choose which gaming device did they want to double down on, Xbox screwed up and decided to try and frame the Xbox One as a cable box that also played games. Who thought that was a good idea is the question of the century. I mean, the people that were responsible for it all lost their jobs, left to other companies. And like, they basically cleaned house because it was such a colossal miscalculation on Xbox's part. But as a result, um, PlayStation dominated the PS4 gen and became the de facto like platform for gamers at the core. And Xbox has been trying to play catch up ever since. So they had a huge, um, fan base and they had a ton of gamers connected and, and committed in the 360 gen and all of that progress was lost in the PS4 gen. And they've been trying to dig themselves out of it ever since. Uh, what they found though was that once they started making acquisitions and once Phil Spencer started to take over, they realized for one, it's really tough to do what Sony's been doing, which is to have a couple of or a handful of studios that make AAA budget or even quadruple A budget third person adventure games, narrative games that are captivating, compelling, cinematic, that drive sales, win game of the year. It's very, very difficult to do that on a consistent basis. Even when they've thought that they had games that were going to be like that, they end up flopping or just not being received that well. Um, you know, they could, even when they pour money and time into it, like with Halo Infinite, the game can be received pretty well, but it's not the, the savior that they needed. Even with something like Starfield, World-class studio, right? Plenty of time, right? Plenty of money, right? And then they put it out and it's just not good enough. So they decided not to rely too much on those heavy hitters. Instead, um, you know, if you think of it like a, an RPG or something, instead of going for like a high crit build, they're trying to go for like a slow burning status effect build where like they build poison effects onto you or, or fire or burning damage or something. That's what they're going for. And the way they're doing that is by making a ton of acquisitions, selling you game pass that you pay for monthly. So on a month to month basis, you're spending more money consistently than you would be on PlayStation. And even though they don't get the benefit of huge out of the park hits or critical hits, they still are doing well. You know, it's, it's a nice alternative. Oh, Jesus. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Oscar, for the $2. Appreciate you. So um, that's been their strategy. If they can't beat PlayStation at the heavy hitters, they're going to have some softer hitters, but they're going to have a lot of them very consistently. Problem has been that they have not been consistent in that last part. They certainly have a lot of games. They certainly have a lot of studios, but they've failed at getting them out consistently. They hope to remedy that 
in the next like year or two as they've taken some time to reschedule and make sure that everything's kind of lined up for a steady pace of games but that's certainly been a struggle for them up to this point however all of this has kind of led to a broader brand identity which is that now xbox's goal is to have games available on all platforms whether it's xbox sometimes playstation as well uh, but certainly xbox pc and xcloud at the very least and that starts to lead people to ask why should i own an xbox if i could just have the xbox app on my pc why not just buy a pc and a playstation why do i need to buy an xbox if i can just play this on my phone and all this and it leads to people wondering what the point of the hardware is and i think it's a valid question and it's clear that the xbox as a piece of hardware has become a secondary concern it's not the focus of the business anymore and i think this is a a key thing that has to be understood before discussing any of this stuff is that playstation's business model is built around having high quality games that sell you on the hardware and once you're a member of the hardware ecosystem uh, ecosystem you're going to be more likely to spend much more money on other secondary things and you know, the things off the PlayStation store that they get 30% cuts of. So PlayStation's whole goal, similar to like Apple, is to sell you the piece of hardware, get you hooked on the hardware so that you don't leave. Because once you get really hooked on to like The Last of Us, swapping to Xbox or swapping wholly to PC doesn't seem that viable because you'll be losing out on those games and subsequent things um, because it's not available on those platforms. So it's that's playstation's model is selling you hardware getting hooked on the ecosystem for xbox their goal is different their goal is to sell you a subscription service that's available hopefully for them anywhere so their goal is not the hardware if you buy their hardware cool but their goal is to get you to sign up for the subscription model and it's a same it's a very similar thing as they've done elsewhere within microsoft the microsoft office suite for example is a, a phenomenal set of tools, whether you look at Microsoft Word or PowerPoint or Excel or whatever, many of these are standards, even Microsoft Teams, uh, many of these are standards within other companies. Uh, there was that famous <laughs> picture that went viral of Tim Cook when he was at like a, a press event or something and he had his Apple Watch on and he's shaking hands with somebody and a Microsoft Outlook notification pops up on his watch as he's taking pictures and shaking hands with somebody. And everybody's like, look, even the head of Apple isn't using the Mail app. He's using the Microsoft email app because it's just better than anything his company has. And that's kind of the core idea behind Microsoft strategy is that they want to have the best software regardless of what platform. So if that means they bring it to Mac, they bring it to Mac. If that means they make games and they bring it to PlayStation, they bring it to PlayStation. That's their goal. And it's very different from PlayStation's methodology. And it does lead into instances where all of a sudden you don't feel that compelled to buy an Xbox. In the same way, like you can buy a Windows PC that's not made by Microsoft. You can buy a Microsoft Surface if you want, but if you also buy a Lenovo, if you also go and buy an HP or whatever else, as long as it's using Windows, Microsoft is still winning as far as they're concerned. So it seems like they're taking a, a, an approach that is closer to what they've done on the PC side of things than what Sony has done with the gaming side of things. And that is why it, it feels so markedly different, is that they've just determined that their strategy to try and play PlayStation's game it just hasn't really worked. So they're trying something different, which is to basically just turn it into Windows and try to sell it and price everything accordingly. Um, so speaking to Polygon, which has chopped the interview up into multiple news pieces in classic early 2010 style, Spencer lamented that the games industry simply isn't growing enough, explaining that all of Microsoft's recent moves, the acquisition Blizzard, uh, concessions, the decision to take Xbox exclusive to PS5 and or Switch, the layoffs have been designed to counter this unavoidable, irrefutable truth. Without new customers, Spencer says, quote, everybody else's customer is your success state. You can't succeed unless you draw in customers from other publishers and other platforms. And because you're not finding new customers with the games that you're building, everybody's kind of fighting over the same size pie. When you have an industry that is projected to be smaller next year in terms of players and dollars, and you get a lot of public 
uh, publicly traded companies that are in that industry that have to show their investors growth because why does somebody own a share of somebody's stock if it's not going to grow? The side of the business that then gets scrutinized is the cost side because if you're not going to grow the revenue side, then the cost side becomes challenged, which is absolutely the case. I mean, it's like what we said earlier when we were talking about the... Um, the revenue splits with PlayStation where their margins are too tight. If this middle dividing line, you know, this is the expense side. And then this is the profit side. And you are dealing with fixed revenue. You know, this number isn't going up. You need to make the green grow. You need to make this bigger no matter what. Otherwise, stock prices drop. It's all these guys are hired to do is to make green number go up. And how do they do that? If this number isn't going to grow... They have to lower this bar. They have to lower the expenses so that this line ends up lower. There's more green. That number went up even though the revenue stayed the same, right? That's all he's saying is that if it's not going to grow, we have to cut so that we still end up with more profit at the end of the day. How they do that is by canceling projects, by downsizing, by... Um, by trying to increase profitability in various ways. That's how they do that. Um, business 101, but it is just the, the situation that we're dealing with. Um, they say in this op-ed, now look, Spencer is right to a degree. And if this were coming from a punter, a rank and file developer at a random studio, game studio, or a modestly successful newsletter idiot, uh, it would be fair or would be a fair comment, maybe. But Phil, mate, I'm sorry to have to point this out to you, but you're the head of Xbox. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure you get to pin all this on the macroeconomic this and that, you know? You have had, I think it fair to say, a degree of agency in all this. Indeed, there are maybe half a dozen people with the power to actually change the shape of the games industry. And for the last 10 years, you have been one of them. I do not see much point in dwelling on how we got here because I think it is quite obvious to us all what's gone wrong. All of Spencer's big bets, the pivot to subscriptions, the variable hardware SKUs, the spending spree of studio acquisitions were contingent on Xbox, not just being, to borrow Xbox's tagline, the best place to play, but the best place to play the best games if there's one lesson we can take from spencer's era it's that you can't enact or sorry it's that you can enact all the disruptive change you want but you cannot disprove the industry's oldest truth great games sell consoles a hundred billion dollars later xbox still doesn't have them if anything i would argue its first party output has gotten worse since the shopping spree began and its struggles are as such no surprise at all um I mean, there's no doubt. I mean, I guess it's just uh, you can say it's Phil's fault that the industry is the way that it is. And I, I would agree, like the multiple hardware SKUs, the Series S paired with the Series X, I don't think was the the best choice when you consider everything. Um, you know, I think you could have done a Series X with a disk drive and then one without that had maybe more storage or something. You know, you could have done that to have um, a lower priced option but i i agree that was probably a mistake um i don't think the pivot to subscriptions has been generally that big of a blunder for xbox they still insist that it's profitable they don't share direct numbers but they still insist xbox game pass is profitable um they probably aren't factoring in the cost of acquisitions to it on the whole like it's not like this year they're going to count 70 billion dollars or last year they counted 70 billion dollars as part of the equation but I do think that they probably break it up over however long it's financed over or, or however else they've done it. Um, they have good accountants to say the very least, but whether you blame Phil Spencer or not, you're still dealing with the same problem, which is that this number is not growing. And that's not just for Xbox. That's true of most big publishers, which is why you're seeing layoffs industry wide. I mean, it's just, people are getting more picky with the games. And part of that is because quality has taken a bit of a nosedive. Uh, and at least in terms of consistency, there's a lot of huge AAA uh, and dare I say quadruple A games that cost $70, which are garbage. And that's made people more skeptical. That's made people more cautious. They don't want to buy a game on launch day unless it's like a nine or a 10 out of 10. And we've seen that all over the place. I mean, like even when uh, Starfield was reviewed and launched, people saw that it was getting like eight out of 10s and people were losing their minds. 
You're like, wow, Xbox blows it again. And I'm like, I'm not a huge fan of Starfield, but it didn't review terribly. You know, it just didn't review as a masterpiece or anything. It was a pretty good game. Uh, like worst case scenario, it's a fine game, but people acted like it was the end of the world because they expected a masterpiece and they've become accustomed to, I think in 2023, especially a lot of masterpieces, you know, 2023 is a very special year, but there's just been a lot of games that have led to people feeling like they've wasted their money. And that's contributed to this problem where people now are not spending as freely. And there's other macroeconomic things like inflation, Oscar Valencia donated $4 you know, wages not increasing, but still. Through Super Chat. <clears throat> Blow the candles before you finish the stream, please. I can do that. I can do that. Um, so I guess with all this, I just, I don't really see what the point is, whether you blame Phil Spencer or not for the current state of the industry. The current state of the industry is what it is. And it's just, they have to find other ways of doing things. <clears throat> because what, what Xbox has been doing is not working. So they're trying something different. Spencer spent part of his Polygon interview musing airily about a dedicated Xbox handheld device, which I'm sure seems like a no-brainer in a world where the Steam Deck exists, but I imagine it will be an alarming prospect for a developer community that is slowly uh, cottoning, uh, cottoning, cottoning, I haven't really seen that used before, cottoning onto the fact that making games for Xbox is too much of a faff. What are these words? They pulled out the thesaurus full force something that takes a lot of effort and causes slight problems okay who knew just pulling out these words and then cottoning i haven't heard that used casually in a gaming article before uh phrasal verb of cotton you're f begin to understand okay who knew the more you know um gaming industry biz or games industry dot biz Chris Dring returned from GDC with tales of publishers questioning their future support of the platform that bakes in so much risk. A dominant subscription service, cannibalizing game sales, the need to ensure parity across Series S and X, and further increasing sky-high development costs while doing it. Um, and it offers such a small audience in return. Now you want a handheld version as well? Best of luck with that. I mean, that's fair. I mean, I, I do think that, again, the Series S has complicated things where a lot of developers are like kind of tempted not to. And the other big piece is you see a lot of games, if they launch an Xbox, what do people say if it's kind of like a seven? People are like, uh, I'll wait for Game Pass. And that for devs is not what you want to hear because if you don't intend on it coming, uh, coming to Game Pass, People are just not buying it. They're like, yeah, I'll wait for some future date, whatever, whatever. Oh, I don't think about it right now. You know, it's just crazy. Uh, it's a, it's a serious problem. It's a, a cascading kind of legacy or secondary. It's like an externality of game pass that probably wasn't really anticipated where Xbox's game pass is such a good value that it's led to people expecting much better value than they got in years past. So they expect if it's $70, they're going to get, you know, a nine or a 10 out of 10. Whereas before like a 60, $70 game was like, yeah, if it's like an eight out of 10, it might be worth its price. But in the age of game pass, it's like, yeah, well compared to game pass, this is way overpriced. So it's just not worth trying. So it's definitely complicated things. <clears throat> Uh, now that all of his big bets have failed, Spencer is turning to corrective measures, short-term fixes that might juice the numbers in the next couple of P&Ls, but seem destined to further weaken the Xbox ecosystem down the line. Bringing the likes of Epic Game Store and itch.io to Xbox consoles could confuse the value proposition, giving users more ways to give money to people that aren't Microsoft and do nothing to transform Xbox's futures. I would love to have my itch library on a console, don't get me wrong, but if Spencer thinks that's going to move the needle in any meaningful way, then I have some magic beans to sell him. And if he thinks that this is a two-way street, the first step on a journey that ends with Game Pass on PS5, Switch, and Steam, then he has truly lost the plot. Yeah, I don't think Game Pass ends up on Steam, Switch, or PS5. Maybe you get xCloud on like the next Switch, maybe. But even then, that might be a stretch because it's like Nintendo might make a policy where it's like, yeah, you can have no data streaming available or no uh, game streaming services on the app or anything like because they, they want you to buy them 
through their stores. So that's why PlayStation's never going to make it available on their platform. It just wouldn't make sense. Um, let's see. Taking former exclusives to rival platforms is yet more short-term thinking. Sure, it may pump the numbers a bit, but each new port is one less reason for a potential... A potential to new customer to buy an Xbox and one more reason for Xbox owners to switch sides and abandon the platform for good. Once again, I cannot see a way in which this ends with Xbox as we know it today getting stronger. That's the key thing though, is I don't think, I do think the Xbox as we know it today or as we've known it for decades past, I think that Xbox is gone. Um, they're trying to transition, it seems, from a hardware console platform into a subscription How service. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you for that. Appreciate you. Um, eight months. Oh, baby. Thank you, my friend. Good to see you. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I think this is the key thing. Xbox, I think already has changed and is no longer the company you might've known from years past. Let's let us assume charitably that Sea of Thieves sells 5 million copies at 40 bucks a pop when it launches on PS5 next month. Let us even more charitably pretend that means $200 million in revenue from Xbox, ignoring distributing and marketing Sony's platform cut and the cost of making the port in the first place. Last quarter, $200 million would have increased Microsoft's revenue by 0.3%. That is merely a rounding error for a company of that size. And where the health of its gaming division is concerned, it's little more than a sticking plaster. To be clear, I feel bad for Spencer. He seems a decent sort. I think he's come into this with the best of intentions, and in a parallel universe where every horse he backed romped home, he would have, uh, or he would be credited with transforming or perhaps even saving the games industry. In another, where spending seventy billion dollars on Activision Blizzard, he spent it on two hundred thirty odd games with the same budget as Spider-Man Two. Perhaps Xbox is flying, but in our world, he has spent ten years and a gargantuan gargantuan amounts of money taking xbox from third place to third place and that is not the market's fault if the writing isn't on the wall for xbox as a whole then it certainly could be for him oh baby savage savage yeah layoffs all over the industry ceos looking for other ways to get uh making games profitable again global poverty rising but guess what it's all phil's fault and it's got his damn game pass putting xbox game on other consoles um i mean i i get what they're saying though instead of spending 70 billion dollars on activision he spent it on 230 odd games with the same budget as spider-man 2 perhaps xbox is flying i mean spider-man 2 kind of budget is the reason why sony made low margin or low profit on those games even when they sold millions that's the reason they've been closing down studios they spend too much sales are not strong enough um, to recoup the investments industry has gone or has to go for smaller games, not bigger ones. It's not sustainable. Brain dead article, PlayStation thrives, having a handful of exclusivity generation. Yeah. Xbox lets them or lets some smaller games go multi-platform and it's the end of the world. I mean, I, I get what he's saying. I get the argument. It's that at the end of the day, they've spent so much money and they're still in third place. The Xbox brand is confused and there's less reason seemingly than ever to buy an Xbox device. I get that. But I think it's because Xbox is trying to change things. They're not focused entirely on selling the box like they were in 2005. Their goal now is to sell the software where margins are much higher. That just makes more sense. So that's what they're doing. And if you buy one of their games on Steam, if you buy it through Xbox, if you buy Game Pass and play it that way, they're happy because they're making money regardless. That's the point. And so many of these articles, I, I often, they often just come down to like, Xbox is, as we know it, is dying. And it's like, yeah, but it's changing and they're trying to do something else that's proven successful in other realms. Um, that's okay. Like that, I don't think that's a problem. Um, it's just different. Maybe it ends up causing like, everything to just implode. Maybe it causes, you know, PlayStation to just grow monopolistic and things get super toxic. We'll see when we get there, but I don't think Xbox is like disappearing. I, I think Xbox is changing a lot and it's going to be interesting to see kind of how the cookie crumbles. Nolan Dixon donated $4.99 through Super Chat. Off topic, but I wanted to ask you something about the Dragon's Dogma 2 Micro. Did everyone forget the first game came out with day one DLC? 
Um, I okay. I'll work through these one at a time. I'll let it read this one, and then we'll we'll go. Richard in order. Granger donated ten dollars through super chat. Thank you, my friend. Did you ever finish like a dragon? Infinite wealth. If so, what did you think? I picked it up after your video. I'm about seventy hours in, and it's some of the most fun I've ever had in a video game. Oh yeah, no, it's it's like hilariously ridiculous. Um, I'll get to that in just a second. I'll go in order uh, that they came in on, um, just so I don't lose track of them. Uh, but first of all, Nolan, thank you for the five. Off topic. Ooh, hundred bits. Thank you, Logan. Appreciate you. Um, and have I seen the new tweets by Xbox's head of marketing? I have not. I can pull it. What's his name? Is it the green something green? I don't know. Uh, tell me in chat what his name is. I can look it up. Um, so yeah, the Dragon's Dogma 2 microtransactions. The the whole thing with that thing, like you can point directly to another Capcom game in the form of Resident Evil 4 Remake that came out months ago, just months, not even like a full year ago, but months ago. And that game had a ton of day one paid uh, microtransactions available on Steam you know, that, that you were able to get to that were gameplay altering and things um, like upgrade tickets and stuff. And everybody just ignored it. Still overwhelmingly positive all over the place. Um, you know, there were some people that were frustrated by it, but like it did not blow up. Nobody really cared. And it's because like nobody wanted to mess with that hot potato of pissing off Resident Evil fans. Um, so everybody kind of just ignored it. And they're like, hey, the game is really good without those things. So we're going to just say the game is really good. And we're just going to move on and ignore the microtransactions. The problem is when games suck and there's microtransactions that fix the game. That's when you have a real problem. When a game's super bloated and they sell you XP boosters. Or when a game is is like super difficult, but then they sell you something that all of a sudden makes the game a walk in the park, you know, things like that, or like a gameplay altering stuff in co-op uh, co games or competitive games. Stuff like that is, is a real concern. In the case of Dragon's Dogma 2 and Resident Evil 4 Remake and Monster Hunter World, like these are games that are really, really good by themselves. And then for whatever reason, Dragon's Dogma 2, people say it's like, um, uh, people say it's bait and switches and things. It was communicated ahead of time. And like, if you want to boycott the game over it, that's, more power to you. Great. Um, but I, I, I just, I don't see if we should, like, I don't know if it makes sense to boycott games like Monster Hunter World or games like Resident Evil 4 Remake for the same reasons, if the game is good. Because to me, it seems like something they put in there just to get Capcom executives to shut up demanding more microtransactions and stuff. And I'm like, they made a good game. And yeah, they have microtransactions available, but the game is still good, you know. Um, performance, absolutely an issue. If you have problems with performance, then yeah, no, don't buy the game. Don't buy the game. As, as I said in my review, like the game is not optimized well at all. <laughs> there are major problems with it. Um, they got to figure it out. And unfortunately, nowadays, the standard for game performance is like, it runs yeah, you can technically play through the whole thing, and that's the standard we hold to now. It's really pathetic. We should do better than that. Um, let's see. Uh, where am I? Ba ba ba. Oh yeah, the second one. Um, let's see. Richard, thank you for the ten. Did you ever finish Like a Dragon: Infinite Wealth? If so, what did you think? I picked it up after your video. I'm about seventy hours in, and it's some of the most fun I've ever had with a video game. Uh, yeah, I've not finished it yet because I got entrenched in like a few reviews that have dominated my time but i actually have uh it up on my rg ally and it's my like um it's like one of my it sounds bad to say but like bedtime games where like i'll lay down i'm like okay time to relax and kind of shut my brain off and so then now i can play it on the ally so i've been working through it but at a much slower pace and it was one of those i was like could i do i could do a bunch of videos on it or something um but I decided that it's just going to be my personal, like fun, guilty pleasure game. I usually have one of those at a time where it's just like, I don't make videos on it. It's just for fun. I don't really try to tackle it with anything, you know, keep it easy. Abhinav, uh, we don't do all caps in chat. Just so you know, it's just kind of obnoxious. Um, 
And I'd say they're worth $3.14 trillion because they do care how much money each of their businesses make. If they didn't care, they would not be worth that much. <laughs> Almost by definition. So <laughs> I'd say that. Um, uh, let's see. Um, what was it? It was... Who's the Xbox head of marketing you said to look up? Um, oh, Redberry. Good to see you, my friend. Uh, where, what was the name of it? Uh, crap. Kello Kilombardi. Okay, so there's Kelly Kelly Lombardi, I'm guessing is her name. That's my guess. She tweeted this out. Raise your hand if you're not a white man and you buy video games. No hate to white dudes. It's just another day in the gaming industry that minorities have to fight to prove they exist. Okay. Nobody doubted that they existed. What? Okay. <laughs> I'm just like, you're just like screaming into the void of like, nobody said they didn't exist. I don't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like you're just out there punching the air. Like I'm fighting the good fight. Okay. Nobody's disagreeing with you. <laughs> oh man. Oh, that's funny. Uh, dude, people falling for all of these. People are falling for all of these April Fool's jokes. It's like honestly kind of hard to watch. Like this one. <laughs> we can't wait either. That's so funny. Okay. <laughs> Oh man. I, well, the thing with those tweets that genuinely shocks me is I'm like, don't like you had to sit down and be like, I'm, I need to make a post. I need to tweet something. People want to hear my opinion on things. And I'm like, okay. Why is Anthem trending? Jar Jarv tweeted something. Hold on. Why the hell would Anthem be t trending? Strongholds and Suicide Squad games should have taken a leaf out of Anthem's book. Custom zones, fresh ob objectives, epic boss fights, um, an exclusive loot worth the fight. Mayhem missions are cool, but fingers crossed for more Stronghold style ahead. I mean, I, I think that there's clearly an issue just in terms of content. I, I don't know what it is. Rock City just seems wholly incapable of putting out significant content i mean it's it's baffling they announced the game four years ago close to four years ago and they barely got a 10-hour campaign together with like two and a half hours of content and then the season one update adds like three mission types that are basically just the same thing as before it's amazing um thank you for the two pip um, when's your Starfield breakdown coming out? Uh, I mean, I'm working on it. I, I keep hoping that we're going to get some DLC so that there's a little bit more to talk about, but there just isn't. Um, so I'm just chugging away, chugging away. I won't put a date on it or anything. Cause I just don't want to pigeonhole myself. Um, 
So yeah, we're we're grinding it. Do you think Starf or hold on? Do you think Suicide Squad can make a comeback similar to No Man's Sky or Cyberpunk? If yes, and then when? Uh, I think this has been asked before. I don't know if you asked it before or somebody else did, but no, I don't think Suicide Squad can get a comeback or anything because Cyberpunk people really loved the concept of the game. People really loved the idea of the game the moment they heard about it, and when they um like when the game didn't end up being very good they just wanted the 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 original promise like they just wanted to see it but um as for like everything else it's i think suicide squad people just were never that into the idea like i think that there was the potential for there to be a (laughs) okay this is funny um there was the potential for suicide squad to be successful but they needed a lot more content and a lot more work that's a great expansion right there look at that look at that look at that amazing expansion (laughs) that's funny okay you got to give him credit for that that's pretty funny so, um, yeah, anyway, I, I just don't think Suicide Squad has that many people that are that interested in it. And I think you've seen that with the player numbers. People aren't even that interested in trying it. So, um, yeah, I don't think it'll see any crazy comeback or anything. Um, did you try Stellar Blade? No, Shiro, I actually am trying it this afternoon. So, we'll try it this afternoon. Um... Yeah, No Man's Sky devs are crazy with a run out. Yeah, I, I genuinely, I'm baffled. It just doesn't make any sense. Um, With, uh, oh, I'm, I'm at Rocksteady. But as for No Man's Sky devs, people who like No Man's Sky are digging it. They just keep grinding away at it. I've tried to get into No Man's Sky. I just, I can't. I just don't have the, uh, the patience. It's like, oh, well, after 20 hours, it'll get really good. I'm like, I just, I don't have the 20 hours to like... <laughs> see if I start to like it you know I just don't have that um let's see Logan thank you for the 100 bits as well since Elder Scrolls 6 is using creation engine still how do you think it'll be received since Elder Scrolls 5 came out in a very different world with very different standards I mean I think the moment that they confirm it's in the creation engine 3 I think you're going to see an overwhelmingly negative response I think people are going to go into it very very uh scarred and hopefully skeptical as you always should but i I just don't think it's i think they're going to be fighting an uphill battle on a lot of the advertising and stuff with it because people are just going to they're going to be so burned and scarred from the last time (laughs) you know but it just works yeah and it has 16 times the detail but i i just I think people have seen through Todd's stuff. He can't just blindly make promises anymore. It doesn't work. So. Um. the guy behind you that's the one and only god howard we like candles in his honor we sure do blow it out try not to let the uh the smoke alarm go off voila Ooh, smoke effects look at that high production value right Uh, Mia says, I did an interview for Judas. Can't say much, but Luke's suspicions on whether the project is organized have some merit. Yeah, it's that's another one of those instances where it's like, okay, so this guy, he has a history of games getting caught in development hell. And then he also has a history of rebooting development when he isn't happy with how things are going because he just comes up with different ideas and wants to change things constantly. And so it's like, Now his new game, he's been working on for a decade and it's really convoluted and confusing. 
what are the odds that maybe similar things are happening? <laughs> and it's like, probably pretty high. Probably pretty high. What scent is he? He is banana pumpkin scone. Yeah, Todd's a, Todd's a bakery good guy, you know? There's some people that like fruity scents. Some people like warm scents or sandalwood scents. He likes bakery scents. He likes it to smell like a, a Panera bread in the fall. He's warm like that, you know? He's warm like that. Put him away for now. Um, anyway. Um, do you think Elder Scrolls will be on par with Red Dead 2 technically? Elder Scrolls would come close to 10 years after the release of Red Dead 2. Honestly, Levy, uh, if it's still using the creation engine, no. Is my understanding after talking with modders who are very familiar with the creation engine is that they, um, the core problems of the creation engine, which is that each like instance has to be loaded separately and they can't be loaded and streamed concurrently. That's something that can't really be fixed without just trying something differently. So even something down to like when you enter into a large um building i would fully expect that the elder scroll 6 will have you load into it like it'll be a load screen walk to the door quick fade to black fade back in um or something like batman arkham asylum where like you walk up to the door open it the camera goes up and you walk in and then you know you've transitioned in my understanding from talking to modders is that the core like the way the engine works requires that for big environments and set pieces that change over with a ton of new NPCs and stuff inside. So my understanding is that something like that's going to still be present even with that. So if you consider even something down to like being able to walk into Saint Denis and just step across the threshold and enter the city, I think even in Elder Scrolls six, there's still going to be problems doing stuff like that. Um, which is baffling and amazing, but it seems like that's honestly what's going to happen. Uh, Derek, thank you for the 10. Why do you think studios are failing to find success with live service games? What are they missing? They're missing that there's a fixed number of players. And in order to be successful in live service, like you have to take players from another game. So not only does your game have to be good enough to review well and for people to be interested in it, but it needs to be so fun and addicting and uh, like sociable that you have to pull players from other games. If you make the, like that, um, that Marvel overwatch game, if you want to make that successful, you not only have to have a good enough game that it's just good, but you have to steal players over from overwatch where they've already paid for cosmetics, where they've already put hundreds or thousands of hours into it. They know the characters and the maps really well. You have to pull them away from that. And that is extremely difficult to do very difficult. And I think a lot of these executives just think, oh, well, Overwatch is popular. We'll release our own and we'll get Overwatch fans to play. And it's just, it doesn't work like that. Um, you know, it, it just doesn't hook like that. Sometimes you get crossover from single player to co-op, like Kino Mansky is describing, where like you can have somebody who typically only plays single player games who falls in love with a live service game and becomes a live service gamer in the form of like if you really liked Hell Divers, for example. Um, so there are some instances where you get some new players introduced into the fold, but compared to other fields, like it's kind of like Phil Spencer said in that interview that we referenced from the VGC Chronicle or VGC uh, article. The industry is much more static and locked in than a lot of these executives would hope it would be. Um, the games industry is growing, but it's not growing at the pace where like you can have a new Overwatch or a new this or that every year and all of them can coexist. Like there's a fixed number of gamers out there and certainly a fixed number of live service gamers and you can't just keep pumping out similar games and have all of them succeed. Like the ones that are most popular and have entrenched fan bases are going to stick around and it's going to be very hard to kick them out. Um, and that's just, they can keep taking wax at it, but it's, it's very difficult to break in. Helldivers 2 is wildly successful because they 
uh, I think pulled over a lot of like call of duty fans. They pulled over some single player fans. They pulled in a very diverse group of PC gamers into a live service realm that they hadn't really played before. And that is why it's so exceptional, but that is exactly what it sounds like. It's exception. all <laughs> like it, it is an exception to the rule. Um, yeah. It's not PVP. Why am I trying it? <laughs> uh, let's see. And then other super chat, um, Astromath. Thank you for the super chat. Love the show. Luke, just wondering if you have any future endeavors. Um, I am sure streaming is fun, but are you thinking of other projects? Yeah. I mean, anybody who's working a job in their twenties, that's going pretty well. You should always have like other pots on the stove. You should always be trying to think ahead and, and make sure that you are ready for whatever comes next. So I frantically save and I frantically invest any extra money I make. And, um, I'd like to get to the point where doing like making content is just something I do for fun. And it's not something that I require on to pay the bills. Like that would be my hope. Um, and I hope to get there one day. That would be great. Uh, ideally you get to the point where you have like F you money and you can just do whatever the hell you want. Like that would be the ideal, but we'll cross that bridge when we hopefully come to it. Um, as for other endeavors and projects and things, I, I'm interested in like the finance, um, secondary channel, I think, or I guess tertiary channel now. So maybe we do a finance channel. Um, people have asked for like movie reviews or TV reviews. The only thing with that is I just, I don't know how to jump through the hoops of the copyright crap you got to deal with when it comes to, to that stuff. So that's just a, a whole other thing. Um, and then actually making my own game I'd like to do. It's just extremely difficult, time consuming and expensive. And, um, so who knows when that project will be ready to see the light of day, you know? Luke wants to be at a point where he has FU money where he gets canceled every week for fun. Yeah, that's just Asmongold. <laughs> I'm sure. I am certain that's who you're referring to. <laughs> Without a doubt. Yeah. What's up, Aaron? Good to see you. Um, okay. How are we doing in 2024 so far? Good, good. We're about to hit probably 500,000 subs on the main channel about to probably hit a hundred thousand in like June for the live channel. Things are just blowing up. We're doing very good. It's a good year rocking and rolling. Um, yeah, I mean, a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of creators I know of that, um, are in similar spots or got to spots like me where I'm at now they were making good money and then they spent it all on like fancy cars or Gucci clothes or fancy watches or whatever. Like they just blew all the money on stupid stuff. And then they start making a little bit less and less and less. And all of a sudden they have no way to do it. They start to panic and they don't know what to do. And when you're panicked and you're doing things for the wrong reasons, just chasing money to maintain your lifestyle, your content takes a nosedive. And so all these things just cascade and I don't want to repeat those same mistakes. So I invest, uh, like every penny I don't spend, um, on like our core things. And since we bought a house, you know, there's other things that pop up. Like I'm having to pay to have my fence replaced part of my fence replaced. I told you guys about that before, but it's like such a stupid thing to have to have done. <laughs> but we have bad wind here and the wind has been blowing this fence down for years and years and years. And I just happened to be the sucker who owns the house at the time that <laughs> now is, uh, falling down. So I got to replace the fence, but, um, things like that pop up, but everything else I, I try to do, we try to do that. I can understand people doing that when they have Jake Paul money, not at around 500,000 subs. Yeah. I mean, a, a lot of people, like you can make a good living at 500,000 subs. If you, but I think the thing is a lot of the people that might get here 
are like younger people, younger kids or teens or early twenties. And they've never had the money from like a decent job or a pretty good job. And so they just are like, okay, I'm going to spend it all because I'm not used to having money. So I'm going to spend all of it. And they end up getting themselves in a ton of trouble. Um, hold on. <laughs> Somebody just sent me this too. Hold on. What's this? I saw the description of it. What is worse than my Tahoe payment? Okay. What do you know what's worse than my Tahoe payment? Hold on. I want to know what is worse than my Tahoe payment. You guys thought that was bad. Wait till you hear this one. It's my husband's truck. My husband drives a 2020 GMC 84 Sierra 1500. We bought it in August of 2022. Okay. Financed it for $78,000. He still has a remaining balance of, I think it's seventy-two dollars or $74,000. Hold on. That doesn't make sense. It's, you've had it for like a year and a half, two years, and you've only paid down two grand in principal. I haven't really checked recently. Thank you, Astro, for the one. Thank you. Appreciate you. Appreciate you. His payments are $1,600 a month. So y'all thought my $1,400 Tahoe payment was bad. His truck payment is $1,600 a month with an APR of 14%. I didn't know you could get a car payment at 14% in the United States. What? Remember what I was saying when I was like, yeah, some people just make like they get a little bit of money and they burn it all on stuff they don't need. I guarantee you don't need a $1,600 a month truck payment. You don't go get a clunker, go get a truck. Hell, go buy a cyber truck through like their official financing and it'll be like five or 6%. But I'm guessing the reason it's 14% is because they probably have bad credit or they probably honestly, usually this is the kind of scummy thing about how APRs work. Usually the less qualified you are, so in other words, the less capable of paying this you are, the higher the rate is and the more this number gets uh, increased. So it's weird. We're like the more you could afford a high car payment or a high mortgage or whatever, the more you could afford it, the lower it will be. Whereas the less you can afford it, the higher it'll be. It's it's stupid, but it's basically built around uh, risk tolerance and things like that. Because when a couple has $3,000 in monthly car payments for cars, let's be honest, they don't need. That's crazy. You can, like If you can afford a $1,600 a month car payment, you're not going to be paying 14%. You're going to be paying like 4% through a private or like a, a credit union or something. And this is going to be for like a $200,000 car. This is insane. This is insane. Hell no, dude. My fiance got a 20% rate. Okay, you need to take your fiance somewhere and get that done. That's... Sh shut that down, man. That's crazy. 20%. This is the problem. Like a lot of people, they don't... Like they're just financially... Uh, illiterate because they've never been trained they've never been taught so they see 14 percent. like i don't know if that's good it reminds me of the parks and rec thing where andy dwyer gets the new motorcycle and he goes up to the camera he's like yeah it's a pretty cool bike it's pretty awesome um you know it's a brand new bells and whistles i got all the extended warranties and uh, i got the really good in uh, really good interest rate i got like uh 28 it's like the highest they were able to give me pretty good because <laughs> he just had no idea he thought high interest was good and in that case that's a comedian trying to be funny this is real life so yeah y'all stop coming after me for my bad finance decisions and go after him because this is a very bad way of justifying stupid decisions <laughs> like it's literally <laughs> it's it's literally uh just being like, well, but he also screwed it up. What's the name of that fallacy? It's the, uh, um, Tuchel Quay. Is that what it is? If me, then you, you know, it's, it's just like, well, yeah, th this is bad. This is wrong, but y this other person did it wrong too. So therefore it's okay. It's like, no, that's not how that works. 
And you backed up too. Too bad he didn't buy his truck for him. I did. <laughs> so yeah. I Wait. Oh God. Okay, just listen to that back. And go after him. Stop coming after me. Bad finance decisions and go after him because he fucked up too. Too bad he didn't buy his truck for him. I did. <laughs> so yeah, I messed them both up. Oops. So maybe we should just let his truck get repossessed and keep the Tahoe because a $1,400 Tahoe payment is a whole lot better than a $1,600 truck payment. Or maybe we should just let them both go back because we have the Audi now and don't need either of the car payments. They got a third car. I'm I'm actually very tempted after that, the reference to the the repo. I'm convinced that, that that's probably just rage bait. I think she's probably lying about all that. Um, that's my guess. Because typically... People who make really bad financial decisions with cars, they are in complete denial at the prospect of it getting repoed. I've told the story before of like a guy I knew back in college and he had like one of those Subarus that was always decked out. I forget what they're called, but it's one of those Subarus that people tend to put like the custom fender on, the custom like wing on the back and they, they do all this like crazy customization stuff and he had all of that stuff done on it. And he uh came like we were doing a, a play together um we were both cast members in it and one day he just was late to rehearsal which was weird because he was always like one of the first people there and he was like an hour or two late and he comes in and he's like sorry i had to take the bus or whatever he said and we're like why is did something happen with your car did it break down you could have just called us for a ride and he's like no um uh, and he's like very awkward about it didn't want to talk about it but finally, he tells us after a while, uh, yeah, my car got repossessed. Like, how the hell did that happen? He's like, I know, it's ridiculous. I only missed like three or four payments. And then they just took my car in the middle of the night. I was like, okay. Hold on. You missed three or four payments over three or four months. Which, let's be honest, probably means like five to six payments over six months. I was like, I, okay, I don't have much sympathy for you. <laughs> like, you couldn't pay your car payment. You don't get your car. It's pretty simple. Like, it's not that complicated. But, wow. So, I, you, in my experience, people who make really stupid decisions with their cars usually are in full denial that they could have it repossessed. Like, no, they can't just take it away. I'll just miss some payments and I'll get back on it. Because they're kind of used to the credit card way of doing things. Where it's like, oh, I have a credit card balance it's super high and i've missed some payments so it's a bummer but the balance just goes up i'll pay it off later in the year or when i get my tax refund or whatever um which never happens but still they say it and so usually they're just in denial over it but the fact that she's like openly discussing how how that's going to happen like uh, i'm starting to think that that's just rage bait I'd like to think nobody's that stupid but if she actually is so stupid that not only did she get a 14 percent or a $1,400 car payment for herself and then tried to get a, um, and then tries to go and get a freaking $1,600 a month truck payment as a gift to her hubby. That's insane. People are that stupid. I mean, if she is so deluded and so arrogant in her stupidity that she's bragging about like, yeah, I guess we'll just get it repoed. It's like, okay, well that's why you have a 14 interest or 14% interest rate because you have terrible credit most likely because you're so willing to just have things repossessed. It's wild. To be fair, my fiance's rate may be 20%, but at least the payment is only like 400. So it's probably like an older car or a cheaper car. Like for a $78,000 truck, which what was the name of the truck that she said? Uh, how I lost it. What was the name of the truck? Um, okay, 2020 GMC. I'm just going to type it in here. 2020, 2020 
GMC AT4 Sierra 1500. How much is that car worth, though? I see a lot of young guys driving these kind of cars where I live. Carfax, Kelly Blue Book. And she said she bought it two years ago. Oh my God. So it's at like 42,000. He still has a 40 or $72,000 balance on it. Fair purchase price is 44. So they're like 30,000 in the hole. My brother-in-law just bought this exact truck. Really? That's funny. Like I, I have a friend that will remain unnamed, but this has been a point of contention where I, I know people who like tie masculinity into their truck or into the car they drive. So like, they don't feel like a man until they drive a truck. And if they're not driving a truck, they feel like they don't have any masculinity. It's really, really weird. Cause like even in instances where these people will be driving or will we will uh, be working a job where they don't need a truck. They just like are working an office job. They could go drive to work in a little sedan, a little Honda Civic from 2005, and they'd be perfectly fine. But instead they go and drive a $70,000 pickup because they like the way it makes them feel, <laughs> you know, it's ridiculous. Cause I'm like, you, it's one thing if you can afford the car, like if you're making $200,000 a year, you can afford a thousand dollar a month car payment. I still think that that's a lot to pay for a car payment. Uh, unless you have like a really, really low interest rate and it's a reliable, like luxury car that's going to resell for a lot. But still, if you can afford a thousand dollar a month car payment, great. Uh, more power to you. Like if XQC wants to buy a McLaren, he can afford a McLaren. Okay. Um, he doesn't need one, but he can afford it. So whatever, it's his money. But when you are getting a 14% interest rate or a 20% interest rate, it probably means that you can't afford whatever you're looking at. It probably means that that's their way of tolerating the risk of your lower income. And they're just going to end up taking advantage of you, unfortunately. Um, be a man. Only drive World War II tanks. Yeah, see, exactly. That's the great. That's literally everyone in the southern USA. Yeah, it's, it's weird how much weight people put on the car they drive. Like it's, it's just, it's odd to me. I don't get it. Like. Um, yeah. Um, the McLaren incident. Oh, was there an incident with the McLaren with him? Oh. Yeah, in the USA, it's a big thing where people tie a lot into their, like, a lot of their masculinity and personality into their, their vehicle. Um, yeah, it's just... All I would say is maybe wait to get your guilty pleasure car until either you're making really good money or... You are uh, like 30, like 40, you know? Yeah, uh, Ella Delia has it right. My One of my lawyers told me, and uh, an officer also told me, um, that he really did not recommend me like communicating or telling people what vehicles we drive. Don't describe our house. Don't describe what color the house is. Don't describe any of that stuff. So um, I will follow their advice <laughs> as much as I'd love to talk about all that stuff. Um, 
I have to be coy. Uh, because the police officers and lawyers probably know what they're talking about. <laughs> probably. Yeah. Didn't XQC's ex take the McLaren away? I saw some video about it a while back. I think he won all his lawsuits or whatever. Yeah. What's your dream car, Luke? You a car guy? I'm not super into cars. It's mainly just I've never had the the money or resources to get like super into it. Um, maybe one day I will. I'm more of a collector. Like I'd like to build a cool collection of historical items and stuff, especially related to ships. Like I'm, I'm more of a ship guy, a boat guy. As you can tell, I have a gigantic model of the Titanic and then one of a pirate ship I'm 3D printing. So I love... I love my, my ship stuff. Yeah, Luke rolls around Colorado in a Bugatti. <laughs> yeah, Colorado is probably one of the worst possible places you could have a Bugatti. Because it's like all of the roads are really arched because they want to make sure um, that the snow melts properly and everything. Like, it just doesn't, it's not a good idea. Yeah. The Titanic never existed. Change my mind. <laughs> yeah, no, it, not in a boat, Aaron. In a in a ship, I sail around Colorado in a ship. Um, okay, everybody, you all are wonderful. Is it hailing near you? I I've been locked in this man cave all morning, so I don't know. Uh, I don't hear anything, so I don't think it's hailing. Maybe it is. I am in the basement. I am in the dungeon. So. What's your dream game? High production value, like Naughty Dog level pirate game. That's what I want. Um, okay, everybody. Much love. You guys are all wonderful. I appreciate every single day. I'm one of you. Uh, we'll be back Wednesday rocking and rolling and uh, chilling and vibing together. It's going to be awesome. You all are wonderful. Stay safe out there. Much love. I'll see you in the next one. Hugs and kisses. Thank you to everybody who sent in super chats and donos and bits and memberships and subscriptions. Y'all are wonderful. Um, much love. I'll see you in the next one. Hugs and kisses.